to consider the minutes of the July 18th meeting. Second. Any comments or all in favor of accepting the minutes presented? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, is the meeting being videotaped? Yeah, oh, yes, and would, you, would the videographer please introduce herself? Mimi Odgers, I'm video recording for North Street Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have Anna Farrington here from Smith College. Uh, you may recall she was here a couple of meetings ago to talk about some signage. Make a motion that we take item number one of old business out of order. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Anna. <laughs> I am from Roll Wrestling Associates. Uh, we are an environmental graphic design firm from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Our firm has been acting as the signage and wayfinding consultant for the college since we designed and implemented the original sign program for them in 1993-1994. They asked us to return to the campus to help them work on a couple of issues that they were having regarding first-time visitors and vehicular traffic. When the sign program was first designed, the uh, desire was to have a very low-profile sign program in place on the campus. It's a historic Olmstead campus. You know, it's, it's a very arboretum-like, park-like campus, and they wanted the signs to be very low-key. However, over time, they realized that vehicular traffic is an issue on campus, and getting the first-time visitors through to downtown Northampton and to the right public or visitor parking destinations is important and was this something that needed to be addressed through signage. So we came back to campus and put together a signage improvements package, um, which is much more extensive than what you see here. This package represents the signs that were in the public way and required permitting through the town of Northampton. Um, and the two that I'd like to present to you today are the two that uh, would need permission from this board to proceed with permitting. So, um, let's start on this key map here. So, coming off the highway on 91, typical vehicular pattern, traffic pattern would have visitors um, coming up five to um, the intersection of Pleasant and Main Street. We do have uh, a trailblazer, what we call a trailblazer sign. That's one of these type signs. Um, at this location, indicating that uh, vehicular traffic should take a left onto Main Street to continue to Smith College. There's an additional sign here, just past the Main Street, Pleasant Street intersection, that's also a trailblazer sign uh, that's directing people to continue straight to go to Smith College. So uh, the first sign that I'd like to present is here at the intersection of uh, New South and Main Street. That is a uh, sign location six on your sheet. This was the sign that Carla had brought to your attention last time. Uh, it's one of the two signs. And what we'd like to propose um, is a relocation of this right lane must turn right sign to this next sign so it has better visibility for traffic coming up Main Street. And adding an additional trailblazer here that gives more specific destination information about the campus. So if you're a first-time visitor, and I know it's hard to imagine from your perspective, and I'm assuming that most of you have been in the city for quite a while, um, Northampton can be a little discombobulating if you're driving through for the first time. There's no lane markers downtown, um, purposefully. <coughs> Pedestrians have the right-of-way, which can be disconcerting for people, especially um, in Boston or New York, um, where you don't necessarily have to stop if somebody is standing in the crosswalk. <laughs> So by the time you get to this intersection, you know, you're, you're a little stressed out, you're not sure where you're going, and we want, really wanted to try and look at this as an opportunity to help improve vehicular and pedestrian safety and also to provide some additional information for those who are trying to go to the main entrance and admission office. So this sign is two foot six by four feet. It sounds large, however, uh, you know, referencing the MUTCB, which is the Mass Department of Transportation guideline booklet from um, the Annual on Uniform Traffic Devices. Um, we did want to make sure that we were scaling our text appropriately for the 
sight lines, this uh, size text gives us about 100 feet of legibility, according to their rule of thumb, one inch for every 40 feet. Also, uh, these typical roadway signs are almost that big um, in terms of the width. It's not much, we're not talking about but three inches larger. So that's the first location. The second location I'd like to propose is <coughs> up on street. You continue uh, past this intersection. We can move over to this plan of view. Um, we have permitted a replacement sign here, which is a vehicular directional sign, and that has been installed. It's guiding people, continuing to guide people to the main entrance and the admission office. What we'd like your permission to do is to place another of those vehicular directional signs here in front of John and Green Hall. For traffic that's stopped at this light, this is a big in intersection with a lot going on here, to reinforce, to reinforce to them that they do need to continue to go straight. There's another college gateway there that's confusing for folks, um, and we really just want to keep people going to the right entrance, um, which is up here. So those are the two signs. Um, does anyone have any questions about these signs? They're not illuminated. They're designed to be in keeping with the rest of the campus program. They have reflected vinyl graphics on them. Um, they're fabricated aluminum with automotive grade paint finishes. Yes? Thank you. Uh, I'd ask when uh, the other representative from the SUP was here back in June. Um, was it June or what? Anyways, it was earlier this year. Um, when folks are coming off of 91, yes. do you know the, the trail that is blazed by anybody using a GPS system? Um, yes, actually. It does take them through downtown Northampton, but uh, because the address of the college is College Hall, it can be very confusing for people. So if I were driving up 91 and I said I wanted to go to Smith College? You would get off at 5. Mm -hmm. You would go up to Main Street. So we'll keep you on five until you get to nine. It doesn't take you, it doesn't wind you through Con Street or the side streets of the Not people going. Right. No. no. It, however, there are several different GPS software out there. There is not one master GPS software that people use, unfortunately. Um, also, uh, with Google Maps, um, there are ways you can have additional addresses added to the GPS database mm -hmm. um, and the GIS. Um, which is helpful sometimes for wayfinding purposes. Um, but not everybody is going to have up-to-date software. Even if we get the right information in there, it takes a long time for people to get updated. The other uh, issue is that not everyone is using GPS. No, that's true. I just, it, <coughs> most college kids nowadays issue. have it. And, most and kids I, do. My, own, my question was, <coughs> and are these signs along the avenue or the, the pathway that they would be led to? Just up, trying to find that. And it sounds like you're going to that be it this point, and then it gets confusing for people. And that's what, that's one of the things that we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. Ned, do you or Jim have any, is this, yeah. is that okay on, on that island there? Any yeah. issues about that? Um, the only issues I might see with it is it might get damaged by snow plowing yeah. activity. It but as head, far as the buses head, turning there, and that shouldn't be a problem. Was placed right now, but um, as we clean heads of intersections, uh, that might be a snow stockpile area. The sign might get damaged. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's a I'm fine with the location. So last time the concern was mm -hmm. that the signs might be too big, particularly the one sure. by the church. I understand that. And you are arguing that no, no, indeed they are not too big. I think it sounds big. I think that um, in reality, it's it's a fairly standard sign for size for a roadway sign. And in order to have the type be legible for vehicular traffic, we need to maintain some kind of minimum letter height that's going to be visible and legible for people. And so these letters are still not as big as that letter. That's the must. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there any issue about moving our sign? This shouldn't be any issue. It's just held on with stainless steel bands. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a problem. I guess the, the only question on that particular sign is that if they're wayfaring signs and we're trying to find the college entrance, mm -hmm. then you have this sidebar sign or the arrow that goes off for athletics. Mm -hmm. Prior to the intersection, are people who are going to try to go down through South Street rather than out 66? That's the only point I bring up. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's uh, a reasonable question. Athletics is the second largest first time visitor destination, usually because of the kids, people cheering on the kids. Um, I think at this location, it's I think it's evident that there's a split ahead of you. Um, we worked with um, Laura Hampton from the DPW department in the field uh, to determine what the appropriate locations and messages for these signs would be. Um, if the uh, athletics arrow were maybe at 30 degrees instead of 45, it might... Might be helpful. Yeah, yes, yeah. So you aren't looking to go immediately sharply. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's a, a minor detail that we yeah. could definitely yeah. adjust. The only other thing I could offer on that is that you might want to consider if you can fit it all in the same size as perhaps put uh, Route 66 underneath athletics. That way it's very clear where they want you to go. Because there is signs right up there for Route 66. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just a thought. Mm-hmm. <coughs> that also would be an adjustment that would be easy for us to make. I think we could maybe have a squeeze it in there. So last, last time the concern was the signs were too big. This yeah. time it seems like there's... Well, I'm well, not. I still, I'm, yeah. I'm still, what's the sign? You said that this is only six inches longer six. than the right lane must yeah. turn. Three inches wider. Well, actually, this is two foot six, so it's, uh-huh. it's not quite 36 feet. This uh-huh. is, typically, this is a 30 inch sign. Across, but across. I'm, I'm talking about the vertical. The vertical, it is higher, definitely, than this sign. What is the length from the top to the bottom of the right lane must turn right sign? Uh, I believe it's 24 inches, so it's twice, It's this is twice that height. And six inches wider. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's awfully big. It is awfully big. Um, that's a concern. I, I think that it sounds big here in this space, however, I, I really think that it's the right size for the roadway. Um, the trailblazer signs that we have out there now, I don't know if any of you have seen them or noticed them, uh, are the same width and if only a foot shorter than the sign that we're proposing here. And if you go out and you look at them on, in the field, they look really small. And the trailblazer ones are the ones in front of the courthouse? And yes, the correct. correct. Yeah. Um, now, when the last presentation was done, there were two signs that aren't here tonight. Yeah, what, what's we, the status? <coughs> we eliminated, uh, there were two signs, one of which we eliminated, and uh, this one we're bringing back. Yeah, that one, but there were actually three presented last time. Yeah, I, yeah, well, no, I don't recall, but the, the reason we're not re-presenting them is we, we heard your concerns, and we didn't okay. feel like we could address them adequately, okay. so we pulled those yeah, off. So one, one, and we, one, and we, one. we do feel strongly about about this one, which is why we're gotcha. representing. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, I was just going to point out it's the one that was across the street on Route 66 that you've eliminated. Yeah, that was and then the one. the one that was we thought was too close to this one, you've eliminated that yes. one. Right. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. The 66 one was the one I was concerned about. Yeah, so. yeah, they had a lot of issues. <clears throat> so clearly they're looking for approval to move forward, <clears throat> or, or it seems like we have to articulate what it, what it is we would like. open to a suggestion. I, I still feel the one that, that's there is, is huge. So I, how, I, big, how big would we need to make it to be accepted? It sounds like it, it, that your intention is to really capture the people who are visiting the campus for the first time. And while I absolutely understand that a lot of people come for athletics for the first time, mm-hmm. the admission one um, is the one I'd be more mm-hmm. sympathetic to. So okay. I, would, I would actually suggest we lop off, lop off the athletics piece off. Yeah. And just stay focused on getting them to main campus. Would that be acceptable for the college? Uh, I'd, I'd have to present it. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, pardon me. Just so if, if I just think the aesthetics of downtown, sure. it's a very walkable, very friendly pedestrian environment, and I think you can over signage it. And I always, I think we struggle with this every time we get a sign proposal. And, and four inches is 
really very big. And I understand your, I understand both your concerns. Mm -hmm. You're saying second most popular reason people come to camp is sure. athletics, and you're also saying the size of the, the height of the um, information mm -hmm. is what's most visible. But yeah. there, um, I think that you might sacrifice for the for the aesthetics of downtown the size of the the um, of the letters in order or this or the second second. Um, I, I, from my experience, I would, rather than making the lettering smaller, mm -hmm. I would remove the athletics yeah, information. Smith would be amenable to that if, if, if that's a requirement for the sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's an incredibly busy intersection. Mm -hmm. I, I would just hate to see it very much bigger than the right lane was turned right side. Mm -hmm. Now it's currently six I inches see. wider. I don't even no. see that side uh, when I go I by. Oh, too far. Oh, so it's 30, 30 uh, inches. Okay. So if the, we made it the same size as the Trailblazer signs, would that be acceptable? And so that would be. That's the same width and one foot shorter. It's the same width as the sign, but only three feet rather than four. And the uh, right turn, right, right lane must turn right is only three inches shorter or three inches narrower. Show you that part of my other, I'm the mother of new drivers, so I'm very okay. tuned into all the signage around. And uh, <laughs> <Good luck with that>. <laughs> <laughs> and there are just intersections that that, that they it's don't know what to do when they get there because yeah. there's so much going on. I and think I think the more clutter we put on there, the more challenging it is for them to navigate. But now you need an opportunity up here to get people to turn. Well, I think in, you mean in terms of the athletic mm -hmm. Well, that was one of the signs that we, we pulled mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's yeah. right, so we can meet your concerns. Although by the time the people would have seen or that sign, they would have already have had the turn. Just kind of confirmation. Well, I think And they can get to the athletics if they end up going to the main entrance. Can they navigate on campus through to the athletics? They so. could. Uh, my hope would be that the buses of students mm -hmm. would not go that way, but mm -hmm. hopefully the bus driver would have had enough wherewithal to predetermine where the heck he was trying to go. Mm -hmm. He or she. Would you like to make a, a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we accept the signage as proposed with the exception to the large one that's uh, placed in front of the Edwards Church that we request that they remove the directional arrow and move athletics from the bottom and shorten the sign. Approximating the, the uh, Wayfarer sign. The Trailblazer The Trailblazer sign. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't care what, they say, what it says. It, I mean, would say, it would say main entrance admission. Yeah. It's okay. not college. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we may not need that in the motion. We're just asking that it be. That, that's the sign except for <coughs> the arrow. Shorten the foot. Yeah. And if you want the monk, you know, Adjust the font or do you know? I don't think we're stipulating what it should say. No, 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 you're right. That's kind of my. No stipulation. I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there a second to that motion? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. You're welcome. For the record, I'm abstaining. Oh, I'm sorry. Any abstentions? Aye. <laughs> The one on Elm Street would probably be installed in the next two or three weeks. The one um, at the intersection is the new cell phone. So we'll coordinate moving our sign. Oh, that, um, you also need a trench permit to do work in the city way? We'll need to pull those permits, okay. yeah. So it'll be a little fun. Not tomorrow. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Um, I'd like a motion to take tourism sign policy on order. Um, so Councilor LaBarge is here with a, the woman who lives, uh, one of our existing tourism signs is in Christine. Christy. Christy's front yard. Second. All in favor of taking old business number two out of order? Uh, All right. I want to thank you for giving. Sure. Um, okay. So we have the uh, tourist sign policy. Um, it has broad uh, specifications for where signs can be placed. Uh, one of the signs on Route 66, eastbound, in other words, coming towards Northampton. Uh, is in Christie's front and she feels that its current location is slightly obstructive. She's concerned about line, uh, sight lines, and she's asking if we can move it. Um, as a corollary to that, Councilor Tacy has gone out and talked to the uh, owners of the vineyard. It happens to be that vineyard sign, and that single sign is their most often use sign. In other words, people who find them seem to have found them because of that particular sign, the eastbound sign. So it's very effective where it is, but Christy is concerned that it should be moved a little bit. Um, at first we were talking about whether there should be a policy change, and maybe it doesn't rise to the level. That was my first thought, is we need to revisit our policy and think about this way. Um, maybe this is the sort of thing we can handle on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, we can. We did some little further research on this, and if you look at the MUTCD, the Manual Uniform Traffic Control Devices, they recommend a minimum of 200 feet prior to intersection and no more than 200 feet beyond that. So within 400 feet of the intersection, uh, 2 to 400 feet, they're looking to be the appropriate place for signage of intersecting side streets. They do have ways to put them further back than that, but they're called uh, special circumstances only. Uh, that might be because of the speed limit of the roadway is 50 or 60 miles an hour or rather than 30, which it is in that stretch of Route 66. <coughs> so we're able to do that, and I believe right now, according to Laura, the existing sign is approximately 325 feet back from the intersection at this point. So if we look at the MUTCD and what their standards are, the extra 75 feet, I think, would put the sign probably squarely right in front of her house, which would probably be even more inappropriate, mm -hmm. rather than somewhere between the two properties. Mm -hmm. So here's a picture. Just pass that around. Just that's fine. Mm -hmm. So that's when we came up with you know additional research, and it's something that we definitely can change the policy to specify the distances, a range of distances prior to intersection the sign should be. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it's going to end up in someone's, it's going to end up in the right of way, but it's going to be adjacent to someone's property. So I guess the bigger question is <coughs> that, do we notify the resident in advance that the sign is coming to your property and give an opportunity to discuss where actually the placement's going to be on the property? And if they say, no, they don't want the property, do we try to move to the next property down? And then what do we say if they don't want it in front of their property either? So it becomes a... It has to go somewhere, and it's going to be in front of somebody's property somewhere. Chris? Um, being the new kid on the block, what was the initial process for approval of the sign? Is there one? Because you, you're saying there has to be one. Is what, what, what says there has to be one? It sounds to me like it's, I mean, is this a city requirement, or is this something that the vineyard itself likes having? Um, I, I, I guess I want to understand what has to be means. This, this process was a long time process. I think it covered a period of two years before the Florida Public Works finally approved the policy itself. Uh, each tourism directional sign is approved on a case-by-case -case basis by the board and solely by the board at this point. It is a free-for-all that anyone can have one. They want to make sure that that's what they are, the directional signs in the more remote areas of town to get them to local businesses and not focus on downtown or King Street or Bridge Street, things like that. Right. Yeah. Um, there never was a clear policy as to where the sign would be, except that it needed to be at least 200 feet from the intersection. 
And so Laura went out and found this. She thought this was a fairly ideal place to put it. And the sign was erected, and shortly thereafter, uh, Chrissy and uh, Mary and the Barnes got involved as to where the sign could go besides her yard or in front of her property. Yes. Um, November 18th was our first site visit, and I know you have all the emails, and that has them, whatever. And what Lori Hans Hansen and Richard, Parcelletti, Parcelletti, and I and Christy, we walked a site area, which was how many feet back, Counselor? You were there Sunday. Oh, about 300 okay. feet. Right. Beyond okay. where it is now. Exactly. So 500 nobody, feet. About 300, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there was not a problem with that. Either one of them had a problem with the site that was kicked out. Nobody ever can build in that site because it's conservation. So we were told somebody would get back to us, but they were not going to have a problem with moving it back. And I think I'm going to let Christy talk because she has great concerns. As a counselor, I have huge concerns of the intersection, where it's at, and I'm going to let her speak. Because I, honestly, right now, I'm completely dumbfounded because the whole point, it's not a matter of this sign is, is huge and blue and ugly. It's a matter of the fact that I've lived in this house for 16 years. It's a dangerous intersection. And it's, it's wording. It's a, a sign that you have to read, you have to comprehend, you have to take in, and then you have to readjust before you hit that intersection. It's a, Willard's trucks run that, that intersection. People coming from, and, and if the winery is saying that people, that it's the most, it's a sign that attracts the most people, it's people that are not familiar with the area. They, they don't know that that intersection is coming up. They need to refocus and focus on this intersection. My son is 12, he's gonna be driving soon. We, we if the, it, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize, but the fact that Mr. Colhane even had put in writing that the sign was going to be moved on July 11th, and, and it's not, it, this whole process to me is a little bit twisted, but it's not, I have a picture 90 feet back in my front yard. There is an intersection sign, square sign, big X on it, warning you that the intersection is coming up. Okay. Clearly, whoever placed that city sign felt that that was an appropriate distance for, for a driver to note that there's an intersection coming up and to regain your compo you know, and see that there's an intersection and to be aware of it. So 90 feet after that, you're supposed to read a winery sign and figure out where you're at and then gain that. Where are your priorities? I, I just don't understand. Two lots up. It's a big open field. I'm not saying that they shouldn't they shouldn't be able to to advertise their business. I'm saying there's a safer place for them. That's all I'm saying. Uh, you know, this policy I've been, I've been told I, I feel like I'm getting a huge one runaround for the last ten months. I've been told that um, it was it was put here because of this policy. It was put here because of this policy. And then I've been told in writing it's been it, the policy was written specifically vague, so it could be crafted into something that, that and formulated into something that could be used in just about any any place, any situation. And then I'm told, well, you, that that doesn't work either. Well, you, you you can't have it both ways. You can't tell me that it was put because of, of the policy and then say, well, it was written vague, so if in case something come up, we can change it. I just don't understand. I don't understand this whole process. I don't understand how someone can, you know, you can, you can tell some, you, you can tell somebody, yeah, this, we'll do it. Okay, I understand. If you don't have it in writing, then you get it in writing. All right, but the, the core of it is, you think it's in an unsafe place. It's in an unsafe okay. place. It definitely is. And like I said, I have. A and there's evidence of that. You're pointing out that the sign comes after the intersection warning. Correct. Okay. So let's stick with that. Let's go with that for a minute. Any thoughts? When we um, accept an application to do tour signs, they usually suggest a placement? Mm, just, I think they just they pick an intersection. Okay. But uh, is, there some, is there some discussion?
discussion about where the signs will be placed at the point of application? <laughs> there is. Under Section 5 of the policy, there's uh, four bullet points for location. Uh, 200 feet from any traffic control sign or device, 250 feet approaching or 200 feet beyond an intersection, 750 feet approaching and 200 feet beyond a railroad grade crossing, or at least 200 feet from any other tourism sign assembly that already has four tourism signs on it. So if I were if I were the winery and I came in and I said, I want to put the sign, you know, here, I'd like it at this intersection. It, it, then then our traffic engineer would go out traffic engineer and, down and make figure some out where to put recommendations it. Recommendations about there. And at that point, there's no other communication <coughs> with any of the property owners mm -hmm. who sit outside of the public right-of-way about where the sign will actually Correct. go. We leave it to the staff and their professional judgment to make the best decision. And that has been the case. And is there a, <clears throat> a given right of way for putting signs on a major or major road? All streets but private ways have right of ways. Okay. And this is an old county layout. I forget the exact width, but it's probably 49 and a half or 66 feet in width, one of the two. Three or four rod, rod highway, they called it. So it's one of the two. I just don't know offhand. So typically, even subdivisions, if you go up into the Ryan Road area, there's 30 feet of pavement, the layout's 60 feet wide. So we typically own up to 15 feet of what's it's perceived to be your front yard. Um, do we know anything about the alternative lots that they're, they're talking about? I believe that that is part of what's called Kensington Estates, is that correct? Yes. And that subdivision has been approved. I'm not sure if the land's been deeded yet to the Conservation Commission, but that's part of that. I forget how many unit subdivision that's going in there is a good chunk of land being deeded to the Conservation Commission. The deed is pending. Okay. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure of the status. And beyond that is Lynn Simmons property. All over On the, the opposite field. side of the road. Well, right. that's where this is. No. Yes. I thought Lynn's was... Um, no, you know where the White Farmhouse is? Yeah. They own all that. Right. Which yeah. is conservation. And then there's an older home that nobody lives there hardly ever. That is that the field. one with the chicken coops? No, that's Lynn's property. That's what I thought. That's on that right side, but she also owns on the other side. I didn't know she owned on the other yes. side of the road. Yes, yes. <coughs> so, is that privately owned land that we're talking about, the alternative sites, or is it other, well, or is it publicly owned land? I'm not sure, because I thought it was Conservation Commission land, now that they're talking about being Lynn Simmons land. Further down. Further down. Right. So is the, I don't know, the I don't have the assessor's map in front of me. They're suggesting it, is, uh, my question is, if we were to uh, encourage the sign to be moved, would it be moved to another private, in front of another private landowner, or would it be publicly owned land? They're saying it would be moved in front of city conservation land, though the land has not been deeded yet to the city. And if it were moved to that other location, does that then fall in the guidelines in terms of the traffic guidelines that the owner uses? Sounds a little far, far out. Not with the MUTCD. Yeah. Right now, if it is 325 feet, and we push it back another 300 feet-ish, according to what uh, Councilor Tacey said, that'd be 600 plus feet in advance of the intersection. And the next distance was 450. It was 400 according to the MUTCD. Unless special circumstances apply in which they have advance warning signs that say, tourist activities next left and then what's underneath it. So it gets even more grandeur. Can I also say that I did talk with the owners immediately when Christy had called me and was <coughs> concerned about the signage and they told me that they came here, it went through the board, they paid for the signs, they knew where, they didn't even know where the signs were being placed. And I told them that there was a problem. In the regulation, is there a 750-foot approach limit? For railroad grade crossings. It's for railroad, right? Okay. And I could just touch the, the human element of the whole thing, which um, Ned already touched on, was possibly notify people prior to the placement of a sign above people that are in front of it. We did it with PBTA signs. 136 of them, I think, in Northampton. 
So everybody, everybody had a chance to weigh in and look it over and see just exactly, you know, what was going to happen, what was going on. <clears throat> People like to have a chance to weigh in. It's just the human element, yeah. whether it's not. So th and that might be the policy change that we make, that moving forward, as we accept these, before we make a final decision about the, that there be some notification to the property owners in front of which mm -hmm. the sign might be placed. I know that was brought up at the meeting on Tuesday. You were there when Paul Spector brought that up. But he felt that we really shouldn't have to do all of these policy changes. I agree with that 100%, and I said that on site. That the neighbors, the abutters, should be notified of a sign being placed. I'm talking about a tourism sign. And eliminate a problem like this. And you know for a fact, as an example, with Habitat, you and I went and talked with residents, mm -hmm. and there was value there. Mm -hmm. And without it, this is what happens. We have elderly people right now who can't be here. They're in their 90s. They're not happy with it. Any more questions? I just want to say that you know this is a, a tourist sign, and I think that I mean the thing I'm struggling with is is that we have professional staff who have standards, you know, good uh, best practices that they use that are in line with the engineering, and I don't want to tie their hands up. I know how busy they are already. Mm -hmm. So I think that what I would like to suggest is that moving forward, the change that we do make moving forward is that when we're doing a tour sign, that as we as more our staff walk there to do it, that there just be a, a notification to property owners in the area that we're going to be placing the sign and let them participate in any concerns at that point. Okay. The we may not need a policy change, though, just as practices. far as dealing with this yeah. particular mm -hmm. sign. We don't get that much feedback about signs in general. This is the only one I can recall recently. I believe, I, I could be mistaken, but the, the, when you spoke to the people at the winery, they didn't have a problem with the sign being moved further No back. problem whatsoever, as long as the sign was still there, <coughs> right. and it was prior to the intersection. In, it, mm. is the, is that, is, are those recommendations, or are they etched in stone? They are recommendations. Some of the METC is etched in stone. Um, we do this. My question would be, is there anything that would prohibit us from moving that sign? Uh, when we, when I... Well, I anyway, no, I'm just asking. Let's, just let's pull it together again. So, um, could I get a motion to let the staff figure out a location for this sign? Um, I mean, is that it, as opposed to changing policy? Well, I think I think I think I'm with you absolutely. I think that there's got to be some sort of prior approval. That's what what I was trying to get at with Ned was how the sign ended up there in the first place. I wouldn't say approval. I just say notification. Yeah, it, we need to let our staff. Well, as Ms. Right Labarge said, as Ms. Labarge said, that, that we need to have an opportunity for input from the people who are going to be impacted by it. I don't know how we're going to work that, but we don't need. To, I'm with you on this one. We don't need to. We don't need to do that. But I but I do think. wondering in the future if input is sought about every sign that gets put in and everybody refuses to have the sign in the right away next to their property, what happens in that case? I'm not suggesting that they have the right to say no. I'm not suggesting that you are. I, I'm, I'm suggesting that they have they be notified and have the opportunity to share their concerns and that we take that into our decision making process as we make the final location decision. But I hear you too. Yeah. Definitely. So can we do we have to tackle that in order to deal with, no. with no, this? No. Okay. So could I, Jim? Just one other thing. If, and this, if the board is going to make a vote about this particular sign, staff has recommended the location of the sign where it exists, and that has presented technical information from the MUTC about the range of where that sign should go. Mm -hmm. If the board wants that sign somewhere else, where do we want it? I'd like to make a motion that the sign remain in place. Okay. Second on that. I'll second that. All right, so that's it. That's it. All right, so essentially the, mo the motion is to go with the staff has recommended. Mike? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. I was, I was headed in a different direction. I view the MUTCD guidelines 
signs as applying to um, traffic control signs, and we we use them as a as a guide on a tourism sign, but they weren't written for tourism signs. I don't believe these guys can tell me. Um, and and in my view, there's no intervening left turn that could confuse someone about where to turn. And so, um, I, I, and, I, and I am swayed by the argument that it comes after the warning sign that there's an intersection coming ahead. So I do think that there are, there are some reasons to reconsider the location of the sign. That's the way I look at it. And, and I would, I, I, I don't, I understand the complication of jumping from one property owner to another. I don't propose how to solve that, but I do think that um, there's some merit in revisiting the location of the sign. Okay. Um, just to, the MUTCD guidance that Ned was referring to is more specifically written related to tourism signs. So we don't <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so scratch, that, scratch that part of my own. We weren't extrapolating something similar. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay, one of the things, sorry, sure. um, one of the things that I think Councillor Tacey was getting at when he mentioned that there, there was a, a discussion of about a 750 foot thing, it, although it applies to railways rather than intersections, is that there is some flexibility as far as where these things are going to go. And I'm, you know, I have enough signs in my front lawn on Elm Street. I, I would, I would prefer not to have another one, so I, it, there's a way to make this work. I'm, I want to find it. So. so the 750, while it doesn't apply here, it, what it to me means is that 400 is not a drop-dead measure, that it can be applied in other ways, and if that's the path I have to do, use to get to where I'm going on this one, then that's, that's what I would like to do. But I hear you, Jim, about finding another spot, and I'm not sure that dumping it on the location of a deed, a, a, a Property that hasn't yet been deeded is the right answer. So I hear that on the stuff. Well, what if what if that property owner approved it now before transferring it to the city? Well, my understanding is the property is going to be owned effectively by us eventually. Yeah. But and it's in our right of way anyway, so we have the we have the right to put the signage there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that then begs the question of you know we talked about notifying the property owner in front of whom the sign sure. is going to be placed. And we should at least, now that we've come to some agreement, that that's probably a good idea before we make a decision about where the sign may or may not be moved. We should follow what we just agreed yeah. was a good idea. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. But where would that leave me if you left it? No, we're trying to work that out. Okay. Could we come back to it next meeting? Well, what will we know differently? People would have a chance to drive out there and look at yeah, it. Well, yeah, for one thing. And maybe we should have. It would be nice if we had a proposal, an alternate proposal by the next meeting. Yeah. Staff would go out and put a white tomato stake in the ground where a proposed new location may be on in front of proposed city conservation land. And you can judge for yourself how back from that intersection that would be and whether that's appropriate distance or not. And can we notify the person who owns that property in front of which we're doing that little white tomato steak? <coughs> so do I have so you have comment? so we we have to either vote it down or I I'd like to, to respectfully withdraw my motion. Okay. So we'll keep working on it. Staff's going to put the stake there. People will stop by, take a look. The tension is, I hear what you're saying, and actually I find it somewhat persuasive myself that uh, it's between the intersection warning sign and the actual intersection. So I, I think you have some reasonable points. Um, on the other hand, the tension for us is we have professional staff. I mean, that's what Laura Hansen does, is work on highway signage. Uh, that's her specialty. And she picked the space. So that's the tension. Um, we're just trying to work our way through that. Okay. Okay. We'll get the uh, tomato steak in before this weekend. Okay? okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.
um, He's already got that done before 6.35. Nice. He's going to be nip and tuck. Uh, next, um, the pedal people have requested permission to use the We have item 6 outside the doorway here. Oh. Oh. Yeah, oh. Yes. I make yeah. a motion that we take item 6, discussion of fine arts permit, out of order. Second. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. My name's Colin Shore. I'm a disabled artist. I'm currently dealing with cancer for the second time. I'm trying to earn enough money where I can pay for some of my medical bills. And I'm looking to be able to maybe sell some of these downtown. I make them out of uh, just straight pieces of steel. And uh, I'm looking possibly to, to sell them downtown because I know it's a big bike town. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to supplement my income. I'm on Social Security, so I'm looking just to, uh, and I believe the, the woman that I spoke to last time said that sculpture and art was something that was allowed to be sold downtown. We had two applications for fine art permit that mm -hmm. I wasn't quite sure what to do because okay. they were a little bit different. That was one and the rock is another one. Painted mm -hmm. on so stone, excuse me. Um so and, and we the were policy as written excludes crafts. Yes. I was just looking for some guidance. Well, sure. Where is our policy? Um I think uh, it's like decorative art. Right. I bet you might have put that on the <laughs> um, <laughs> It's crafts, items, and crafts, utilitarian in nature, utilitarian like half a cup with your kid's picture on it. Right. We like deny that. glass blowing. We deny. <coughs> we did glasses yes. that, like that? Yes. Wow. They sell them at Don Muller and other places, so we weren't allowing that, mm -hmm. and <coughs> Yeah, there's nobody downtown, excuse me, there's no one downtown, I tried to, to go to the uh, Michelson Gallery and they <coughs> shut the door in my face, they weren't really interested in the stuff that I do, so as far as I've looked in all the galleries downtown, there's nothing comparable. So you're looking for a permit to sell these on, as a street vendor? <coughs> yes, ma'am. We set up the permits a few years back so people could yep. sell paintings that they made, sculpture. The, the intent was that it be works created by the artist that would normally fall in the category of art. Fine art. Fine art. I have to point out that Mr. Huntley never pointed out this aspect of my responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we talked about having the Arts Council be our arbitrator. I would think that's a fine idea. Or the bid. So the business improvement district. We could, they sort of yeah, the business improvement district. I know, but they sort of, the they're the ones something. who are concerned about the ambiance the yeah. in the downtown. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think, yes, we have five minutes to less. I think that, to me, the definition for fine art versus craft is one of function. So if you can figure a function for it, we've had this conversation, so if you call this a takeaway, it's a craft. But if you call it, call it a meditation stone, to me, it's fine art. It's hand-painted, it has a, a little jewel on it, so it's a collage, which is also known as art. Um, I see this as sculpture. If it was a coat rack, that's a craft. So I think it falls into the category. I would say that that is fine art. I would say that's fine art and it's cut and dry. That clearly has a function beyond art. It's function is glass. So it's a vessel for water. So that to me makes it fall into a craft. Love it. And also, <laughs> second. Well, all right, so. So, BJ, you'd like some kind of ruling about 
does this fall within the acceptable category? Mm -hmm. Anyone like to make a motion one way or the other? Do we want to put a time limit or is it open ended? Our discussion? No, the permit. No, the, for, for the, the permits evaluation are, of the activity. The permits are calendar year. So it will go to December 31st within the hours that they're allowed. And is there a specific location where this? We've delineated some locations. Yeah. For example, the little arts kiosk area. Yeah. A few places like that. There's a lot of regulations attached to it. I personally like this type of activity and think it lends itself well to interest and attraction to the downtown area. But I also think that we need to be mindful of store owners down here and artists who pay rent and taxes and income. Okay. Jim? I guess the only comment about that is there are store owners that sell fire art, so the very concept of the policy that the board has approved goes counter to the fact that there are galleries that are selling paintings. So there's going to naturally be some overlap by the fact that the policy exists. I don't think that's the issue that we're discussing. I think it's just to help BJ make a decision on what fine art and what's craft. Policy's been in place for maybe three years now. Right. Se seems to be running okay. Yeah, we recently revoked one permit um, because they said they were doing photography, but they were actually selling crafts. How many of these normally do you approve of roughly? I mean, you know. Yeah. Maybe 16. Right. So we're not we're not we're not in a situation where we're going to have umpteen people jostling for space or anything like that. No, not so far. Okay. And maybe we should have a limit of permits that we issue. That they're all out there all the time. Well, they're limited by space. Yeah, they are. Yeah. 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 And it's first come, first serve. Right. Whoever at the space first gets mm -hmm. the space for that day. Mm -hmm. So is anyone in line to make a motion? motion? That we <laughs> accept this as a appropriate um, items to be vended at under our sidewalk yes. permit. The sculpture. I'll second that. Is this both our items? Yeah. That's oh. not mm -hmm. his. That's someone else's. Right, I know. Well, I'm just saying, does the motion yes. cover both items? Can we separate them? Oh, I guess sorry. It's up to you. You're going to throw stones at Oh, jeez. <laughs> but it's a permit that go, would go through the end of December of this year, right? No. Full calendar year or just okay. the end of this year? End of this year. Oh, okay. December. So all so permits expire at December? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the motion was for covered spoke. And it was seconded. Okay, further, dis further discussion? All of the except all in favor of accepting these two categories as fine art? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. <coughs> I, I have one more question. Um, the bicycle sculpture, I do other sculptures of animals and birds and that type of thing. Would I be able to sell those as well, or just limited to this one piece? Oh, I think something that's similar. Well, you similar you aesthetic yellow. to this. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's I have elegant looking birds and moose and animals that I make out of scrap metal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I mean, you know, abstract, arty. Yeah, it's beautiful art. Yeah. How much for the plate? Yeah, that was one. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, I'm probably going to sell them for about $50. I'll be seeing you soon. All right. Good luck with that. Thank you. How, how do I proceed from here? You can uh, come in tomorrow or whenever, 8.30 to 4, Monday through Friday. We're open. Okay. You can come to the front desk. Okay. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you so much, you. folks. I really appreciate it. Thank you very kind. Thank you. Just a little FYI, uh, 
in Britain after all the we had a resident on my ward that had junk in his yard and motor parts and things and we tried to clean this up and it went to court and it was deemed by the judge that he agreed with the deal, the junk dealer, that it was art. There was nothing to be done. In this community, so, I'd rather leap towards calling something art than calling something not art. Well, <laughs> we did talk about having the Arts Committee uh, mm -hmm. be the arbiter. Yeah. Yeah. The, or, the or question or that, that did it in the courtroom was he had asked the judge to define art. And Richard Perry could not do that. It's not the judge's job. Well, he knows what he's easy. Right. 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 We're going to see it. <laughs> All right. can, I, can, we, can we have a further discussion with just for a moment? Because I do, you know, I, I, I question also, you know, us it, making yeah. these decisions okay. where if there's now a group, the business improvement district is, isn't that part of the city? Isn't it the, no, it's freestanding. The it but, but they're funded with... They certainly have aligned interests. They're fun, yeah. funded with uh, um, voluntary tax. Bond, uh, from business to volunteer. It's a... It's an assessment. A, uh, it's a, I thought there was a it's a defined, the governmental defined unit in the sense that it had to be approved. But there, my understanding, I guess I would like us to recommend that rather than these type of discussions and us trying to make the best judgment for what's good for the downtown environment so on our own, that we might look to direct people to have a conversation with the bid or an approval of the bid because of because I do think there's this tension between street merchants and property owners. And well, but, any, but also we have to support staff because that's that's why this is really ended up here is because oh yeah, I Jay was worried about making. No, but I think that before it should be Jay that yeah. it comes that it's done vetted by somebody who's concerned about the downtown business district and what what's happening in terms of activities and but that might be mm. a different. It does seem like a lot of. For street gardens, a lot, a lot of hoops for them to jump through. I, and I don't even know what the BID would think about it. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. Yeah. Or the last time to put it. Okay, well, we could look into that. Perhaps you could inquire. I will. I'll okay. I accept the assignment, Chairman. <laughs> and, and, you know, may, and maybe there's, I don't know, the arts, do we have an arts council? We do have an arts council. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes, so yes. That, yes. Maybe they could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like glued on rhinestones and meditation stones. Okay. Are you an art critic? I was wondering, I, I didn't have a strong feeling about it. And you want to well, show historically, it? I don't vote anyway. So <laughs> sure. um, okay, Annie Sullivan Chin from the Pedal People would like to request permission to use Pulaski Park on September 14th from 2 to 4 p.m. Oh, it's the 10th anniversary of the Pedal People Cooperative. Mm -hmm. Do we have all of the insurance and the evidence in order? Well, right. It's going to be pending that police concurrence. We haven't okay. received it back. So pending for I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll get that. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Now, request for approval of the... All right, so Timothy Van Epps has offered to... Donate sufficient money to build some speed humps on Union Street. And my understanding is that the city council ultimately would be the body that could accept the money. That is correct. So at best we can uh, advise the city council that we would support such an initiative or such a move. Or we can pass it along to the city council without comment. I would like to move approval. And did you all see the letter from Beth um, Bolton? Yes. So there, there are some concerns on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Discussion? Does the, the staff is recommending that there be speed humps installed at this location? Those are neighborhood driven. It does show that the temporary speed humps that were placed did slow traffic down to an acceptable limit within the speed limit. Um, so it's really uh, the Transportation Parking Commission that's approving it. Staff is working as uh, technical advisors to the commission on that. 
So there's a process, right? For that. It's a process that's approved by the TPC. Um, it was in the traffic calming program. It did uh, meet that there needed to be something. Of course, the biggest issue right now is funding these projects. I believe there's 19 traffic calming requests in the city. Some of them have mitigation fund from business development. Some of them have, most of them have no funds. Uh, we're working on a contract uh, looking at tonight that has got state hospital mitigation funds for approval. Um, this one happens to be the only one that we're aware of that's a private donor at this point. So what you're saying is that there are situations in which um, non-taxpayer funds come into a, uh, a situation to make, to increase the, um, uh, the value of the city or the roads or the... They're actually attached to the neighborhood. Wayne Fighting through the planning department collects mitigation fees, such as a, as a business. You are limited to 15 sparking, parking spaces, but you needed 32. Right. You'd be charged X amount of dollars per extra parking space as a mitigation fee. Mm -hmm. That money's collected and it's supposed to go back into the surrounding neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So the Montview neighborhood, which we're currently constructing speed bumps right now, which are part of another traffic calming study, you see that thing in the order of thirty-two thousand dollars in mitigation funds dedicated to that neighborhood. So we are installing four speed bumps as part of that. We've done some enhanced uh, crosswalks and signage down there as part of using that money on a South Street corridor. I forget which business it was. I think it was the book company down in Dewey Court. We use it to enhance pedestrian crossings and signage on South Street. And tonight, uh, later down and under contract number or item number 14, is a contract to further enhancements on South Street using both was business mitigation funds from that South Street neighborhood, plus mitigation funds from the state hospital redevelopment. But do you, as part of the DPW, have control over the, how that's assigned, or where does the, the where does the authority come for assigning? Um, that is usually comes from Wayne Fighting or at least from Wayne Fighting as long as we're all in concurrence with it. Mm -hmm. The mayor actually had to appropriate forty plus thousand dollars of the state hospital money to be used on South Street. Mm -hmm. That uh, that is his final say of how that money is appropriated for traffic mitigation. I I am I am uncomfortable about this because I can see Mike going in and saying, I want this to happen on my land and on my street. I wonder if MJ is right across the street from him and, and she doesn't want this to happen. And so that we would get into the fact that that economic um, right might make, economic might might make right. Is it, is it a slippery slope? Well, I think you have to look at each one on its own merit. Yes. And, and in this case, the, the merit is that it's good for the whole street. Good for the public in general. If in fact that, that's and, and the only reason we don't have more speed bumps is money. Uh, I don't know that that's true. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it's, it's true or not either, but there is a whole process. So the, this person who's putting up the money went through the process. So there was a traffic copying ap application. To do the application, you need signatures. So you need to have some sort of neighborhood buy-in. Mm -hmm. okay. And then they, we ran a test. So everybody got to see what it looked like. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone's object objecting to it. Um, it worked out. It made sense. Um, it, it's not the highest volume of traffic in the city, I don't know, but when the, in the traffic calming uh, formula, what moves your project to the top is how many signatures you get. There's a bunch of other small criteria, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. funding is worth 100 points, I think, something like that. So it really boosts your mm -hmm. your score uh, if you have funding, and that's so that's why this one where it is, it has funding. So it met all the other criteria, and there is other criteria. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, Rosemary. I'm, I'm very uncomfortable about this. Um, Beth makes the economic elitism argument, which I think is a little bit where you are. I hear it. Um, I come to it from a slightly different perspective. I believe that there are government functions that are essential government functions, um, and that when we start delegating them to individuals because they have the wherewithal to do it, um, it's a slippery slope. It's it's just a slightly different one. The the ability to do it at some point may become.
some of the expectations that, that other entities will do it. Um, and I think that that's I think that that's a bad way to go. I don't I don't like the idea of privatization of government. Um, so I'm very uncomfortable with this. I, I hear the economic realism argument, but I also hear what you're saying, which is that there are cases where money is the is the issue. Um, I would prefer that that isn't the case because I think it I think it allows us to do a lot of things that in our hearts we would prefer not not to do because we can afford to do it by finding an alternative. So if this comes to a vote, I'm going to abstain. Jim. Well, I guess I, I just wanted to say that um, just to reiterate what Gary said that <clears throat> this is not the case of someone walking in with a check saying, "Hey, I want a speed hump on my street. Can I put it in? Here's the money." You know, it's a whole process for the neighborhood that had to get together. There, there were signatures and an application that needed to go through a whole process that had to review the thing technically. So it was, it was really like a number of hurdles that needed to go through before the point where even traffic calming was approved. So the, the whole project had to go through a process to the point where it needed to be approved. And then, you know, if there's no funding, then a lot of you, as Ned mentioned, a lot of these things, you know, they, they, they get put on the back burner because there's no money for the vast majority of them. So to me, the differential <coughs> is, is um, personally that it's not just someone with a check <coughs> saying, hey, I want to see something built in the city. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a project that had to go through a long city process and required a number of approvals to get there. I, I, Mike, um, two thoughts, if I can remember. One is I, 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 I'm in favor of the concept. I mean, I, I think one of the pluses is um, if this project gets taken off the list, everyone will all ever get moved up one spot, and you know if we ever come up with money, they'll get it sooner. So I, I think that's fine, I, and and I like the idea that it's gone, it's been vetted through a very common process that, that all these projects go through. Um, but I also question whether we can just um, issue our approval based on the technical merits of the project um, and not I, I, it, since we don't participate in funding the other projects I'm not sure why we're adding our voice to the funding of this project a refinement Just so the board knows, for the past three years, I've gone to the Capital Improvements Committee with a request for $100,000 each year for traffic calming projects. None of them have ever been funded yet. So it just clearly shows that there's a lack of city funds to make these projects move forward at this point. I'm not sure what this fall's Capital Improvement Committee will, will happen, but for the past three years, it's been uh, not risen to the priority. So... Uh we had uh, speed bumps, had speed bumps on Riverside Drive for a while. They're approved? They're, are they There's in the not of consensus of the neighborhood of okay. whether they should be. But it, say that there was, <clears throat> and we heard that Union Street was able, somebody was willing to pay for theirs, so we did a bake sale or something, we could get ours installed and it was, had gone through this process? If it gets approved by the city council to accept the gift. Um, I I I actually, that's, that's the thing that, I've, you know, if it, we know that you go to capital improvement and we get, you know, it feels like we've got more compelling infrastructure needs than speed bumps. So I wouldn't want to take anything away from you know, the other more dire things that we have to fund speed bumps. But I think the speed bumps are a really important piece for neighbors and for neighborhoods. And I don't like, I, I'm discomforted by accepting a donation to make it happen, but... That might just be the reality of municipal yeah. financing. It's called libertarianism. Well, that's the essential argument for the power of money. Um, and I do hear what you're saying, that there was a process in place here, which is why I'm not going to vote against it, but I I still have that <coughs> somewhat nauseous feeling, so I can't, I can't. And I also hear your all votes will float. I, I totally get that. Um, so I think all these things are, are right and proper and good, but I, I can't. Is there any advantage to taking Mike's suggestion and refining it to pass it along that we uh, stipulate it's been through the entire process? It meets all of the criteria uh, that the department might have in terms of uh, location of the speed bumps, uh, the effectiveness of the speed bumps, and leave the donation, the aspects of the donation piece to the city council? 
they've garnered more support? Well, uh, it certainly garners my support, but I support it. You have it anyway. <laughs> 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 no, but it's, it's, it's yeah, it about it. It's, 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 it's I think that what we're struggling with is the acceptance of a donation for something that we think should be municipally funded, but there's no municipal funds to support it. That's it's an awkward yes. situation. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that we can concur and support the process that the decision was made at, but no, while not having to endorse the acceptance of the donation. Like a lot of things, it's case Do you have that, PJ? Yeah. So I'm glad to hear that there was a process. I mean, that's great, but it's still the old, the the idea that if you're doing government, you should do it fairly for everyone. Yeah, I, I think we have we have that in place. Like, uh, you know, the reason that some of these other projects got funded is because somebody else funded them, mm -hmm. and they funded them because they had a desire to construct something else on city property and to mitigate whatever the impacts might be on that. Required to fund, to put money in a fund that would be determined by the city how to spend that money with neighbor, neighborhood input. So, you know, the, the source of the money to me really falls to the bottom, even though it makes the project possible. Without the money, we aren't going to do it. So, if you focus on the criteria for the project and less on where the money came from to support the project, I think that's where we need to be. As chair of the Transportation and Parking, we sat through all these meetings and we went through all of the uh, criteria that um, it, it, Laura Hansen did a magnificent <coughs> job, traffic counts, everything, safety at the school. We had consent of the neighborhood, it was all on board, the whole street was. Uh, one resident asked that it be moved some 40 or 50 feet, it was moved, they were happy, uh, and then we actually moved it further down the street so they didn't have a chance to speed up to go between the speed bumps. Uh, it was it was an exhaustive process, and it, it worked. The, the temporary speed humps worked out beautifully. They worked out. It slowed traffic by five miles per hour. Um, we kicked this around a long time, and everything. And it's like everything else. It's like the rail of barge, the fountain in the center of Florence. There was no money for that. So Gary is right. You know, the funding is what it's all. So what it's all about is where's the money going to come from? <clears throat> and where the reality is, as we continue, and I've heard this board talk about it a million times, as you get cut more and more and more, somewhere these funds got to come from or just do without. So <clears throat> we have, and the board, this board was not going to fund uh, this little fountain in the center of Florence at the Trinity Park. And we now have the money for that. And I'm hoping, uh, I just got my letter from the ethics that there is no conflict of interest. If I donate my labor, I just got that email yesterday. So I will be coming forward to you with a plan and hope that you will. The city council has already accepted the gift, and the gift, the acceptance of this gift, I think, is on tomorrow night's agenda at the city council. So, I could, but your point um, is that it's been exhaustively reviewed. Absolutely, yeah. and, and and my and the and biggest you thing full for me. Approval of your committee. Yep, and the consensus of the of the neighborhood was on board and the safety of the school, the Bridge Street School, which is right there, made it another um, huge, and we were very fortunate to have somebody that had the cash. Great. Very uh, Actually, I told Mimi she oh. could say something. I, I just I want to say that I, I agree with Chris on this, and I think I see where he's coming from about what government should be responsible for in the sense that, and I know that it's not necessarily what yours, it's the city council that will make this final decision, but um, I under, a, a fountain is a little different to me than safety on the roads. And the reason I say that is because um, I'm sure there's a lot of streets in maybe Holyoke or Springfield that probably need these things as well, but they wouldn't have the money. And it, to me, it's a slippery slope towards libertarianism about the fact if you have money, you can have protection, you can have safer streets um, that are privately funded. It, it's, it's concerning to me. I think it's a slippery slope. I'm not opposed to speed humps. I'm not opposed to safety. But I have to say that I can understand the uncomfortableness with this decision because, um, it, to me, it's different than funding a park or fund, you know, putting money into, you know, what's going to go with the recreation fields or doing any somebody making a private donation for that because everyone can use it. But this is really about a small section of people who are af able to afford this, and I have to say, as a citizen, I'm of, of just this country of, of democracy. I'm concerned about it, but I just want to say my piece.
So I just wanted to, I appreciate the process aspect because I think that that's really important. But I, if that money were going into a general fund and then it would be decided for the betterment of everybody that that's what it was going for, that's one issue. But having it go for a very specific growth work is, a, is the same as like any kind of private donations. Having done a lot of work in the nonprofit sector, if it's restricted funds, you can only use it for that. And this amounts to restricted funds, and I don't think that's an appropriate use of public monies. Because it's you know, pro appropriate use for, uh, it's not, it, it's a private donation for a restricted use. It's not going into a general fund. It is really for everybody. Well, could I just check sure. one more thing? Karen, I know we're out of time. Well, you have to leave. Yeah. Oh, well, you're out of time, so I, I have to stop. <coughs> Um, I'd still say that uh, the, the money that came from these other projects were, was very much the same. It never went into um, a, a general fund. Mm -hmm. It was earmarked specifically for a very local neighborhood, a neighborhood impacted by mm -hmm. the for project. Example, Smith College. That, that was, that, I see that actually completely different. <laughs> <laughs> well, those speed pumps were way different. <laughs> First of all, there was no, I don't think there was a, uh, Well, there was a neighborhood process, but it came after that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a different process. <coughs> no, I, you know, that it's not like it, somebody says, you know, I want to do something for my street, but I know mm -hmm. I can't, so mm -hmm. I'm going to give the city $5,000 so the city can decide to do something on the most needy street. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think you'd ever get You'd never get the money. Right, right. So, right. I understand. So it doesn't make sense. And I do feel better that it did go through a specific process. Yeah, yeah. But I don't. I think the outcome is also uh, kind of interesting because I am a Riverside Drive resident and uh, I, I'm not in favor of speed pumps on that street. I just don't think that there's too much traffic. Yeah. I think it's appropriate for some of these short streets yeah. that are cut throughs. Uh, Grove Street is a great example. I think that was yeah. very successful. Yeah. Uh, in limiting just shifting the traffic where they should be on secondary roads and not on whatever yeah. the pet tear down it. So he will not be buying cookies at your bake sale. Well, I think the, the, the right solution the Riverside, Riverside Drive is bike lane. It's a narrow bike lane. It's not yeah. technically a bike yeah. lane. But the, the Riverside white lines and squeeze the cars and create that visual friction, which is what happened on Elm Street. Well, and the, the Riverside speed pumps moved all the traffic inside the street that goes right by my house to avoid the Riverside speed pumps. <coughs> Actually, I hadn't known that the neighborhood made the decision that it was for them. The neighborhood didn't. I think actually the neighborhood thing. would like the city to make a decision, a recommendation, and that's with, from an engineering perspective. I think that's what okay. You guys have that sidebar later. Yeah, later. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right, so you can't tell can we call the question? That's right. You can't? You don't want a meeting? Well, okay. well, we'll yeah, I hope the question can help. All right, so the motion on the table is to uh, recommend that the city council accept this generous donation. Uh, that I suppose I'm putting words in your mouth. That we approve the technical <laughs> merit of, or, or the the technical merit and the, the process, process has been right. fulfilled. Okay. All in favor of recommending that the city council accept the money. Aye. 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 All opposed to the city council. Uh, recommend. All opposed to recommending that the city council accept the money. So. Three yes, three abstentions. Ooh, we have a tie. I have to vote? No. No, no. no. no it's abstaining. Is that Chris? I am. I'm, I'm abstaining. Isn't that a tie? No. Three nays yeah. would be. Three nays would be. A oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got yeah. it. No. Okay. It's three. Three zero. It's like there are three of us here. This is. But a this quorum. is very interesting because very it's interesting. three. Not a quorum. Freeze no, you, you you don't. You only need the quorum to hold the meeting. Not to vote. Well, we've got we. That's got true. Nothing quorum. requires us to vote. Yeah. So it'd be. We'd have to be. Wow. Gene, what do you think? Don't get me involved, and you're in the. No, the, no. The as far as the Robert's Rules of Order, is this? Yeah. I, you, you would need a positive, an affirmative vote yeah. of a majority of your board. All right, oh. so I'm sorry. I guess I'm persuaded by um, Gary and, and I, I 
feel like <clears throat> everything but the final step in the process was followed. The traffic uh, committee went through the whole process. They tested it. The neighbors are un uh, unanimous, unanimously in favor of it. I guess I'm persuaded to vote in the affirmative. I I'm glad you're I'll just say that. I mean, I understand. Well, your horse is in. Yeah, no, this is, this is I mean, great. Changed a lot, but I think it is uh, <clears throat> a little bit more um, presentable in terms of thought process and things. So, there's a document there um, that you received, and the other uh, document that was sent out um, that I sent out by email was a, a summary um, updated revenue requirement table, which showed um, this fiscal year and the, the next. Uh, two fiscal years and what the projections would be for revenue requirements for a utility at this time. So we've, we've gotten beyond um, sort of the CDM report in terms of discussion of revenue requirements and projects and, and how a utility like this might work. And um, we've come up with um, revisions to and updates to what the revenue requirement would be and then um, subsequently at the bottom of the table what the estimated fee would be for um, same with family home and other, um, other classifications that we receive, uh, we receive a bill under this utility. So I think that's it. The summary we've been working to try to get beyond the CDM report and update information. And if you want to add to that, term. <clears throat> No, I, I think you've done a great job. If you look at the, uh, the numbers there, the first column is the money that was spent last year, the year ending at the end of June. The second column in, moving from left to right, is money that's budgeted to be spent from this year, right now. <clears throat> um, you'll notice in the second section there, moving down from the top, first section, second section, that money, that amount represents 50% of what we think the Army Corps of Engineers requirements are going to cost. That's the 276 number? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Th th actually, this is uh, due to the EPA permit. Uh, we anticipate that with the new permit, they're going to substantially increase the um, maintenance requirements that they're going to mandate uh, and the testing of the outfall water. Um, it's, it's really sobering. If you look at um, how many catch basins we have, uh, it's on the order of 4,000 catch basins. Uh, in the new, you know, with the new permit, they're going to want us to clean many of them twice a year. You start to do the math, that's 
approaching seven or 8,000 cleanings annually. Can't clean during the winter. We don't clean on weekends. And suddenly, you're looking at numbers of like 70 catch basins a day if we're going to comply with the permit requirements. We're not going to notify the homeowners until No, but, but you know, you could see you're going to need two crews working practically nonstop yeah. just to keep up. They want the streets uh, to be swept more frequently to get the, the, um, the, the dust and the dirt out of the gutters. Um, so it's not insignificant what they're what they have told us they will be asking for. The next section down there is more related to um, what the Army Corps of Engineers is asking for. Uh, no, it's not true. That's just mostly concentrate coming up. As you move further to FY14, FY15, in that infrastructure investment section, those 250s are um, what we're hoping to set aside for future projects. Debt service down below. Uh, if you look at debt service, general bond. <clears throat> this is money the city is currently paying for projects that have been completed. We anticipate that the city will want to take those payments and move them over into the enterprise fund if one is created. And then the anticipated future debt, a little further down in that section, is would be what we expect to spend if we borrow money to do the various repairs at the, and the um, studies that the Army Corps of Engineers is mandating that we do. Which we really have no choice. No, I really don't think we do. Do we want to retain? Do we want to retain the ability to have certified levies that results in people being able to avoid buying flood <coughs> insurance? Yes. Yeah. So the stick is, if we if we say if we don't comply with what the army is asking for, the stick is that they would decertify the levies at some point. I, I imagine we'd have to come to quite an impasse before that occurred. When they're decertified, they're labeled as inactive, and then the next time FEMA withdraw, draws the hundred-year flood maps. Those lines will go into Pomeroy Terrace, uh, the lower parts of Pleasant Street, Com Street. Um, I spoke to my bank, as I was saying at the joint committee meeting the other day. If properties that had a mortgage were suddenly within the 100-year flood zone, the uh, mortgages would be in technical default. The bank would give those homeowners 45 days to secure um, flood insurance, or they would force secure it for them. At a, at a sky high rate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it'd be very, right. it'd be awful. I just don't see any way to even contemplate not um, complying with what the Army is asking for. As far as the stormwater and the new permit, our only option is to, to in a sense, turn off our stormwater system. We either comply with the EPA or we have to stop transporting stormwater into the rivers and brooks around the city. Where are the bells? <laughs> I, I just don't see if there's any, uh, there's no leeway here. It just has to be done. I, I know you brought that up at the last meeting last night. In regards to the banks, that you went to a bank, mm -hmm. what bank did you go to? Northampton Cooperative Bank. And what did you ask them? Because I said, I want to go to the banks with my husband on Friday to talk. If, all right. If, FEMA redraws the 100-year flood maps, and suddenly a property which is currently not within the 100-year flood zone. For example, the properties in the meadows uh, down by the airport, those are within the flood zone. Uh, if properties that are on presumably the safe side of the dike are suddenly within a newly drawn flood zone, then they need flood insurance to qualify for a mortgage. That's what I was told. So, that's the stick in both cases. I, it doesn't appear that there's much leeway here. Jerry? Yes? In the PDF file I sent out that I'll take the presentation to you with Rotary, there's one slide in there that talks about the number of affected properties 
and their property value attached to those that would fall within that hundred year floodplain mm -hmm. that could be affected. And it's, if I remember, I think the number is like two hundred million dollars worth of affected so property. Yeah. So that's that's it. So what we're, what we're hoping to do with these two pieces is to create a um, a simple package that we can give to city councilors, interested citizens, to the Gazette, to uh, the Bill Newman Show, to Fred Contrada, <coughs> to Republican, uh, to at least get this conversation off to, uh, in a manner that gets us all talking about the same thing at the same time. What we should try and do, if we can, is line up, and Ms. Labarge just, just basically put this idea in my head, is line up a, co a couple of financial people who do mortgages who will just say this, which is, you're covered by, yeah, effectively, that day, you're covered by nothing, and this is what it's going to cost you. And just, you know, have them making the case for us. Because, you know, we're, we're, we're staring at creating yet another revenue stream from people who are already feeling it, and we're going to have to make a really compelling case mm -hmm. that this is, and uh, it shouldn't be us. It shouldn't be us. I mean, obviously, we're going to be driving it, but I, it shouldn't be us alone that's making that case. Mm -hmm. It has to be other citizens who are going, this is, you know, this is the doomsday scenario for all of you people. I can tell you right now, when Ward 6, I know my residents, and they are livid with what they're hearing. Okay? You're going to really have to sell to them. Yeah. Because they're not going to bite it. Right. Well, we'll need your help. I need to do a lot of research on this. Okay, fair Just enough. Just like everybody else has in here. Fair enough. But I think we'll need to... But I'm being this, serious. We'll Not just Ward 6, self. we're hearing it throughout the city. Right. That they're constantly taking out of their pockets. And they want reasons why this has to be done. That's why I'm asking mm -hmm. you about the banks. Right. Okay, because you're really going to have to prove to them that this has to be done. Right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I'm hearing it every day. Yeah, me too. And my people are not afraid to come out and boycott or do whatever. If they feel enough is enough being taken out of their pockets, there'll be an outcry. So you have to present it with due respect and educate the public and tell them why this has to be done. There's, I, you probably know this, there's, the discussion is, <clears throat> there's discussion underway about having a uh, the city council meeting in September at JFK. Um, do you know about this? Did they finally decide? Uh, well, no, no, I guess it's being discussed. But, well, I do know for three days it's been very difficult to get a hold of Bill because the mayor's office, Kareem, was having problems all day trying to get a hold of him. I mean, we have a heavy slate. Yeah. There's no question about it. But I'm going to ask you as a city councilor, okay, you did the $25 increase on seniors and also handicapped. It didn't come to city council. There was no open public session, which was asked for that to be done at the senior center. Then the 9% mm -hmm. sore and water rates, okay, huge outcry with that. Mm -hmm. And they only had a couple of days to come in here. This place would have been packed. They're asking me now, why are you depending on city council to come to us and ask us for help when you never had to do it before? So that is something what you're going to have to bring forth to the public because mm -hmm. they're going to want to know because they're asking me, why are you coming to city council? Well, you understand why, I assume, right? What is it? Oh, you, well, the city council has to pass an ordinance. Well, I know we've got to pass the, the ordinance. Yeah. Right. And it's a big one, yes. because it's almost like an override. If you look at that for 20 years, it's almost like an override. And that's where the fright is going to be. Mm -hmm. And you will be questioned, is it going to rise every year? Is it? You can't say. I, uh, Nobody can say. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> we certainly don't. That's not the plan, but... I hope not. If the Army Corps, if the Army comes back in five years and it says blah, blah, blah. It's put us into a predicament, yeah. which is not a healthy predicament. And hearing now from you 
that Ned is going to have to look at his department because of more restrictions coming down of looking at doing all these drains at how many staff a day in order to abide by what they're asking for? How can he do it? How can he prove to the residents, well, this is what I'm going to have to do. Am I going to have to hire more people? He's going to have to. I think the demands are huge here. It's, it's, it's part and of the I think our reps and our yeah. senators should know it's caused a burden on for the, the departments. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, I mean, nearby communities have had to raise tens of millions of dollars. Chicopee, Springfield. Um, I know. It's, it's, it's great to live next to the river, and on the other right. hand, it gives us an added burden. But this is not going to be an easy one. I can tell you, I'm being honest with you, I hear it every day. They're not going to take it lightly. Right. Not just my ward, many others. And I'm not going to obligate myself right now as a city councilor. I want to hear, and I've been to every meeting that you've had, 8 o'clock in the morning, faithfully. And I've been reading that book. Okay? I'm also going to engineers and talking with them also. I want the facts. I want the true facts and what they're going to do for Ned, how he's going to have the staff. And how are my people going to be taken care of, not just in Ward 6, but throughout the whole city? Yeah, it's a huge fair amount enough. of money. One called me today and said, Counselor, I can't afford it. There is my medication. I believe it because I'm not going to say what her income is. And that's another question, too. People are asking, are you going to exempt people 70 over like we do on our taxes? And that's another thing to look at. If they're 70 and over, do they, do they, they get, get a, a break on their water? They, I don't know about that. Taxes. I think, this I is not know. a tax. It's a fee. Um, I don't. I think they pay water sewer. Yes. Um, yeah. That was brought to my attention. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, th I I hear you. Okay. Storm water. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions for Doug? Can I add one thing? Sure, please. That um, putting a fee in place um, will relieve the burden on um, residents because it will spread the cost of that throughout the city. Um, commercial properties, nonprofits. Who are not paying now will pay because they're contributing to stormwater to the system, to the problem, and contributing to the flood control. So, 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 so paying for this through the general fund will put more of a burden on residents than shifting it to a, a fee that's spread, you know, throughout. Equitably right, across the whole right, city. Right. So, so that's. What do, you, what do you do like with condominiums? Say you have forty units. They they would be then charged. How would you charge them? Each, each unit would be charged a the, the flat fee. Each with larger, with, first of all, this is being worked out. But broadly speaking, with larger larger pieces of property, you can actually measure the size of the parking lots and the roofs and the roofs. It's not practical for residences to be trying to nitpick about who's got the bigger driveway. Right. But once you get into large, larger properties, we can actually measure the square footage of the impervious parts of their property and, and build them for Because I got a call on that today of living in a new unit uh, up in Leeds, and is that going to affect them individually? And also, like each one of them would have to pay sixty-six dollars a year. No, I would think it'd be less money in the case of a condominium. There'd be some economy of scale there. There, the total bill for the complex would be much higher than sixty-six. Right. Right. So right. And con condos, I think, is one that we there's we need to work out that that okay. detail because larger residential would be. Yeah. Condominium fees were going to be. 
I mean, we're getting all kinds of calls now. Sure. Right. No, it's... I don't know. But, I, yeah, my point was just that, this, that these things do have to get paid for. The question is through the general fund or through a fee structure that spreads that out in a different way. So I think that's, that's a point that, that shouldn't be lost. In. And, and I hope we never get to the point where we, if it were in the general fund, I, I can just imagine some awful decisions having to be made at some point or another. I mean, do you lay off two teachers and a fireman because we have to do this or that? I mean, you know, the, the amounts of money are easily that large, if not in some cases much larger. So we have meetings planned for public yeah. education, the meeting right. of the council and some public meetings this fall to really roll it out and give yeah. the people the opportunity to come to understand why we're moving right. this forward. It will be, be interesting. Very. Okay. Any comments? I just want to say that I think this is going to be really useful. Good work. Um, my only other question was, uh, we know this projects out further. Is there a reason why you didn't want to carry it out beyond 15? Well, I think the reason is that we, um, what we did is we had to pick the projects that were absolute priorities right, that, were really, that were really not, that were re there was really no option about yeah. them. The thing about the CDM report is they have a lot of projects in there that yeah. the city may decide not to do it. Okay. Good. Can I just ask you about Austin Circle? Because I read that whole section. Maybe Ned, you could explain that. Where is that on this so-called twenty-year list? Well, I think the I think the issue with the list is that, um, and I guess it just follows up to what I was saying was that it's going to be up to the board. If this utility passes, it will be up to the board and the city council every year to come up with a list of projects that are going to be funded. And the priorities will be evaluated every year based on the amount of money we have and the projects that are being demanded and then see where it falls. In the CDM report, if you read it, mm -hmm. they identif we identified to them, uh, I think about four areas in the city where we know there are chronic drainage problems. And we asked them, actually out of interest, just to get some idea of the scale of the cost, what might it cost to deal with these four areas? Um, just to get a handle on what kind of money are we talking about? They didn't do any engineering work. Uh, we didn't, by any means, say we want to do these right away. We really wanted to get, a, as I say, a, a sense of what it might cost to tackle something like one of those projects. Unfortunately, when they then put together the budget and, and some of their projections, they assumed we'd charge right into all four projects, which wasn't in any by any sense of the word our intention. So reading their um, their projections is a little scary. Well, I think Austin Circle Ned, what was it, 1.5 million? About that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're so involved with Austin Circle, they have been sitting back asking and pleading for help. So if they're going to hear that they're going to pay out of their pocket and they could be on a list for 15 more years, boy, I hope I'm out of Ward 6 for a while. <laughs> Oof. Well, I was just going to say, no, that was that was what I took away from the report was that this was a demonstrative list, it wasn't an exclusive list, and it wasn't a required list. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know... This, this is the kind of order of magnitude we're talking about to take on this type of project. And so, you know, we are, we are free to abide, delete, and add. So, you know, I suspect we're going to do a lot of it. Just a quick question. Um, I haven't really actually read the report, but is there like a um, time frame as to, like, is this the projects over the, I hear 15 years, but are they saying it might span 30 years to complete all of this? Is there a, I'm just curious, is there like a, that if the money starts coming in, that we would hope to meet the majority of these projects by a certain time. I didn't. I didn't know if there's just it's an unending thing, or if there's actually like maybe a light at it's, the end of the tunnel. It's time. unending in the sense that big portions of the infrastructure are on the order of 100 years old. Right. You know, we'll never catch up with all of the maintenance. Uh, you know, 
by the time we start to catch up, new, new sections will be 100 right. years old. Right. Um, what drives it at the moment is there are specific requirements from the Army Corps of Engineers and from the EPA. Right. And that's all that's in the budget. What is the bare minimum that we have to do right now? Okay. We might be saved by a drought. <laughs> I don't think Kansas feels safe, right? I don't either. If we have the drought, how much can we pay to buy some rain? You, meant, you said in the last statement, you know, the word maintenance, and I, and I think that that is what they part of the cost is going to be is it's maintenance. It never goes away. It never stops. And you always got to clean catch basins. And now we're being required to clean them more often, to clean the streets more often. Uh, so that's, that's to me, a piece of what's driving the cost. And that's a forever cost. That's never going to go away. And then the fact that our infrastructure is 100 plus years old, um, it's, we're way beyond keeping it to good repair. Let's put it that way. Called replacement. I don't think one can replace an entire utility as is. so it's good for another hundred years. It just doesn't work that we're at that point where it's, it needs to be replaced, but we would never do it all in one. So it becomes an intense issue. You're going to replace a thousand feet. Nothing. So, for example, in this coming uh, year, Marianne, we're going to uh, Put in 4,000 feet of, is that right? 4,000 feet on North Street? Mm -hmm. 4,000 feet of storm drain. Um, which, you know, at first blush, that sounds like, all right, that's not bad. <clears throat> well, if you do the math, it turns out that it'll be about like 160 or 170 years. Mm -hmm. if, if we kept spending at that pace, it'd be about 160 years before we could circle back to North Street to do it again. And won't last that long. So even what sounds at first glance like a reasonable amount of work to be done in any one year, 4,000 feet, uh, it turns out to be that's not sufficient to keep up. Well, if I have to wait another 100 and something years, Austin Circle is going to be on the water. <laughs> They're going to be really frustrated. <laughs> yes. All right. Storm water. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Welcome to Stripper's Committee. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. Uh, okay. Um, thanks, Committee. Seven items in two hours. Let's skip the case. How about number four? Contract for sodium hypochlorite for the water treatment plant to surpass chemical company <laughs> in the amount not to exceed 24,000. Uh, this is our in-year contract. Um, uh, last year's price was 66.16 cents a gallon. This year it's 71.2 cents a gallon. There was uh, three bidders on this. High bid was 89.8 cents a gallon. There's a proposed waiver from the mayor on this project, so the $25 fee would be uh, waived on this. Has supported the mayor's office, supported the bid, uh, has police concurrence already. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, 
contract for Skata support to Allen Associates in the amount not to exceed $24,999. This is our annual contract with Allen Associates for working on the Skata system at the water treatment plant up in Lewisburg. Uh, we had no bid quotes from Auto Tech out of Quaker Hill, Connecticut, and Elm Electric out of Westfield. Aaron Associates has been associated with the plant since it was constructed in 2008 and become operational. Do we uh, normally pay the full amount? Uh, it's not to exceed $24,999. We don't pay anywhere near that. It's $100 per hour, I think. Yes, it is. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, item number eight, uh, change order number one to contract number 227-12 for the water supply asset management plan to pay an Howard in the amount of $4,500. Second. Discussion? This is uh, an amendment with Tate and Howard um, for work associated with the water supply system um, asset management plan. When we had developed <clears throat> when we had negotiated the original scope of work um, with Tate and Howard, this was a task that was proposed and we had removed um, at the request of the board because the skills necessary to complete this task we have in house. But what we have found is that I don't have the time to do this task and I'm at the point where I'm holding up the I'm holding up work that they're doing because they're waiting for me to do a, a future water system demand analysis. So I asked them to submit an amendment to, to do that work so we can do the project. On so you're the speed bump, Jim? I am the human speed bump. Quite effective. I'm sorry, what's the task? It is um, to develop future water system demands. So it's an analysis of historic and future water usage trends and consumption. I'm ready to vote. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> All right. So moved. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Uh, we are now ready to do item number 10. I hope yeah. that Gary continues. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what, what happened to 9? No. Ow. What happened to 9? Uh, I thought we did that one. No, 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 no we didn't. Okay. okay. Contract for an 11 foot snow plow. Well, the Mount Everest, the model R132, TEL3654SH, to so J.C. Madigan, in the amount of $98 the Mount Everest model. <laughs> it's the Everest. <laughs> uh, but I didn't have to sign the ID, I can chair. There's only three signatures, it's not a quorum. Can That's I get true. a motion to buy this massive plot? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, this is a large plow for our 10-wheel trucks. Um, the other one is pretty much uh, broken and dead and broken frame and so on. So we do have the mayor's permission to buy this. The high bid was $10,450. Low bid was $9,882. I said these plows are used on our major routes like Route 66, Route 9, Route 10, etc. It's a big plow. And we only have one of them? We have several. Oh, okay. <laughs> how, does, how does the mayor get in the picture? Uh, the mayor approves every, well, these are contracts so the mayor will approve it, but what we did on this one, we weren't sure of the price, so we floated a request. Anything over $1,000 out of our own end budget requires the mayor's signature in advance. So we floated this down in advance to make sure that he was on board before we brought this to the board. Oh, okay. All in favor of buying this plot? Aye. 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 Excellent. No Contract for cross connection control software to mm -hmm. Toke Software in the amount of $5,400. This is a sole source agreement, our uh, contract for Toke, which has been um, our software for doing our cross connection backflow prevention program for a number of years. Uh, Tommy McCarthy is in the process of slowing down and retiring and getting out of this. He's been a subcontractor for us for 15 plus years anyways at this point. So what this is allowing to do is, um, we've spoken to the mayor about it, he's approved a new staffing plan that would allow this cross-connection survey of backflow preventer to come on full-time to the department during this calendar year. With that, we need to purchase the software, we need to do the newest extracts for customer billings, 
Uh, we need some custom, custom test result updates to talk between Tommy McCarthy's private machine and our software with our equipment that we'll be utilizing for this and basically set up and training for $5,400. The state mandates this program. The city's been using a revolving fund for the past, I don't know how many years, at least 12 years on this um, as a revolving fund. More than likely this revolving fund would stop after this full-time person and staff and up on board and Mr. McCarthy's contract's over. It would just be a, a revenue and operational cost to the Water Enterprise Fund. Currently, that's how it's paid out of now. That revolving fund sits inside the Enterprise Fund. Any questions about that? All in favor of buying the software? Aye. 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 Contract to Michael Warren for the implementation of the Forest Stewardess Stewardship Plan in the amount of 42154 how long a period of time? Okay. How long a period of time does that contract cover? Is that the whole? I mean, is that a one-year contract? Because he, that plan that he briefed us on last year was a, a multi-year. This is the first. Last week, I'm sorry. Well, like a solution to that question. Um, this is a contract with Mike Moore to, to help implement the four stewardship plans that we could have made a presentation. Yeah, last week, made, right? So this, um, what this contract does is it starts the process of doing um, silvicultural practices in um, five of the stands of, uh, uh, in, the, in our active watershed. So basically it, um, it does cutting plans for timber harvesting in uh, stands 8, 16, 18, 19, and 20, which I can point on the map if people are curious as to where those fall exactly. Um, but basically what he's done is he's picked out um, the areas that are the easiest to do timber harvesting right now. Um, so basically in terms of access, lack of invasive species, um, general suitability for silvicultural practices. Um, so this, um, this, this uh, contract is for doing all the work associated with um, working those five stands. Hey, Jim, some that put around may not have. I'm just curious uh, the um, just for a sense of scale, the size of our forest land and how, what the percentages of this these five stands. I don't know the answer to that. It's, it's a fairly small it's a small it's a small amount. Okay. This is maybe ten percent of the total land it might be ten. Okay. Uh, it could be less than ten. How about a ratio of the uh, value of the timber compared to the uh, cost of the uh, his services? Uh, the value of the timber is estimated to be about 52000 And the value of this contract is about $42,000. Um, so these are mainly, these are selective cutting um, plans that he's going to be doing out there, not clear cutting um, in there. The cutting is designed to achieve the goals of water supply, as he discussed and presented at the last meeting. So. Um, they're focused on um, creating conditions for establishing um, an understory viable desirable seedlings, which he, he had talked about a little bit last time, um, improving growing space for different types of hardwoods, including red oak, black cherry, and black birch. Um, there was some work on selective harvesting that we began to reduce the amount of hemlock and, and red pine some of the other species he had mentioned that are stressed in the watershed. So the removal of some of those also work to, um, to improve the health of the larger uh, hemlocks and things that are still healthy at this point. So it's a, you know, an evaluation in each stand that, that he will do to specifically determine which trees need to be cut, how much space he wants to open within one of those stands. Um, so very specific to each, each of those five. Mike? Um, Jim? This contract is for his consulting services only. That is right. The, the, the actual work of silviculture and cutting gets done by a bidder that wants the, the lumber. That's right. Okay. Does this scope include monitoring the, the cutting process? It does. It involves um, preparing the cutting plans 
for approval by BCR, administration of the contract, um, locating and marking um, the work in the field, um, notifying of letters, um, keeping tallies of the timber removed, doing appropriate advertising, um, working with us in development of the sales contracts of the loggers, um, and coordinating uh, with BCR final inspection and closure of the permits that are pulled in order to do the work. Jim, in the past when Carl Davies was doing this work, uh, his contracts were more like on the order of $5,000. And we made enough money from the logging that it actually was able to fund our program for purchasing properties. Um, at this rate, potentially we can maybe make $10,000 from this. Um, be a long time before we'll fill up that account again. Is this... I, I didn't... I didn't... wasn't here for his presentation. Is this the approach he's recommending that we take across the board in the forest land? Or is this... Is there something special about these properties, these parcels, that require a more delicate approach? I think this may... Yeah, I don't know if it know how to describe the, you know, respond to delicate, delicate approach, but I guess it's a more, there won't be clear cutting will be done. And the way he described it in the last meeting was that um, a lot of the revenue and the value of the timber products that are out there um, are, are in the trees that we want to leave standing for the health of the water supply and the watershed. So he said it's ironic that there's a lot of value out there, but that's not, those aren't the trees that we want to cut for a lot of reasons that he describes in his report. Um, so some of the trees that have value will be taken down, but um, you know other ones will be removed that will have lesser value um, that will be removed for the over to um, ensure the long-term and overall health of the forest. He was careful in his presentation um, to talk about, we had a discussion about um, impacts of logging on invasive species and the future health of the watershed. and. Um, a lot of the logging that was done in the past um, was done in larger areas, I think, that opened up the land uh, to make it more susceptible for problems with invasive species, which limit the ability to do silvicultural practices in the future. So, in other words, areas were cut, they were open to a lot of sunlight, a lot of invasives moved in, and that's preventing the reestablishment of, um, of trees that would have forest, forestry value in the future financially. Harvesting. Um, so the the work, if we look at the work that, that Carl Davies did years ago, a lot of the areas with the worst infestations, they're going to be a problem for the city in terms of harvesting in the future. The areas that were previously worked. So Mike is suggesting the forest is suggesting that the work that's done is being done in a more uh, selective manner, better better. He feels in tune to meeting the overall watershed um, and water quality objectives of the city. So the bottom line is, he was saying there's a lot of value out there. It's not going to be turned into dollars and cents for the city. And I think this probably is going to be typical of, of, of what could be expected. Chris? I actually think it's it's probably, this is this is probably the better portion of it based on what you said about the, the accessibility and the, and, the, and the harvestability of the lots that he selected here. Because one of the points that he made during his presentation is that where invasive species are present, um, it doesn't make any sense to log, or, or potentially could move in, it doesn't make any sense to do logging without also some sort of remediation of the invasive species themselves, and that um, he felt that in most cases, the use of herbicides in situations like that, the cost of that, and, and the profit you would get out of the lumber would basically be a push. So I don't see it getting more profitable down the future. If anything, I, I, I would assume that it's going to go the other way. But that was just my reading. And something like a red oak, say, I have no idea what the trees are, but is leads to better water? I think what leads to better water is a sustainable forest that you know is going to be able to stand for the next 100, 200 years. And, and when you read the documents that he that he wrote, it was surprising that there were areas of the forest that really aren't that healthy, and there's a lot of 
Um, some of the different types of species have you know they're they're being attacked by um, you know either different diseases or pests that are causing them to be damaged and, and, and potentially risk the long term health of the forest, which in turn you know would <coughs> risk the water quality within the reservoirs itself. So it's um, I think trying to take trying trying to take care of um, species that won't be sustainable in the long run. I mean, I think the, the hemlock is probably a pretty good example because of the, the hemlock lily of Belgium, which is attacking a lot of the hemlocks in this region. Um, it's not going to be a sustainable um, tree in the forest in the future. And right now, I think there's some parts of the forest that we that we own that, you know, is a fair amount of hemlock that's out there. Red pine is another one. We have red pine, <coughs> red pine plantations that are out there that are really at the uh, term sort of terminal stage of, of their life. So those need to be dealt with and they need to be regenerated with, with, with a variety of species that are going to have the, um, that'll have the health in the long run. Um, so it's really trying to come up with a more stable type of environment in the watershed, I think is, is the goals of, um, of the stewardship plans. Great, thanks. But it's not a case of our forest being worse than the surrounding really endemic around the region. And it's, you know, I found it quite a shocking report. Yeah. And, yeah, and it, was, it was a superb report. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Both, it was superb and shocking. The idea that the, the hemlocks and the red pines are effectively gone. It's just, yeah. All right. So the vote is to approve this contract for $42,000. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Amendment number one to contract 08-12 for computer network support services to the data foundry. Uh, we would like to extend the contract through September. Um, the goal was that MIS would be actually coming up and taking over substantial, if not all, work up here by data foundry this past year with uh, uh, some uh, personal life issues that George just went through. So with that, um, we started work on MIS and now my understanding, MIS is going through a study itself as to MIS infrastructure, staffing needs, salaries, things of that nature. We had money left over from last year's contract. This extends George's contract into uh, September 30th, so we continue to do work. We have a contract out on the street right now that was agreed to uh, by MIS that we should keep on George for another year of contract services while we try to determine what's going to happen with MIS in the city overall. So for the next board meeting in September, you will see a contract coming forth with some vendor, I'm not sure who, <coughs> that it's due, I think, three days before the next board meeting. So this keeps uh, George moving along and doing work with us in conjunction with MIS. Uh, MIS has been up here quite a bit also trying to learn our system, also during the past six months. Any questions? All in favor of approving the contract? Aye. Aye. Uh, land acquisition. A purchase and, we have a purchase before us a purchase and sale agreement for the uh, Benny Park property in Hatfield uh, on Rocks Road and Chestnut Mountain Road for 7.187 acres, uh, amount of $22,000. Move approval. Second. So this is what had been discussed about in one of our previous executive sessions on land acquisition. Uh, we did come to final negotiations with uh, Miss Benny. And she signed this purchase and sale agreement for the board, the mayor, and the other city officials to sign going forward. And this is on the east side of the Mountain Street Reservoir? It is on the east side of the Mountain Street Reservoir, uh, containing about 7.2 acres. Any questions? Does all of that fall into the drainage uh, basin to the reservoir? It does. Um, Not quite all of it. See where it is. I think it's, it's right in this vicinity here. It's also shown in this handy map. Right oh, now. there you go. <laughs> I didn't see that handy yeah. map. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. It's, about, it's about three quarters of it that fall within right. the It's just a little red right square here if you want to okay. circulate this. This was the appraised value that we offered with the timber value, if I remember correctly, on this question. It 
Certainly not more than the sum of those. No. Yeah. I think it might even be less. Thank you. All in favor for uh, authorizing the staff to sign the contract? Or I guess we signed it. You signed the contract. Sorry. All in favor of um, approving the uh, purchase and sale agreement? Aye. 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 Contract the Highway Safety Systems uh, for South, New South, Front Street, and Leonard Street pavement markings, rumble strips, and signage. With approval. This is the work that I talked about. Oops, sorry. This is the work I talked a little about earlier about mitigation funds from a couple different projects. Uh, obviously, the one up on Front and Leonard were due to the Pat Melnick subdivision Beaverbrook and mitigation money he put into the neighborhood. And then the second one was a combination of state hospital money and South Street mitigation funds that the Office of Planning and Development holds. Both of those came up with neighborhood input into uh, enhanced pavement markings they want to see in the neighborhood to calm traffic. Um, with it, we received one bid. We had two bidders take out plans, but we received one bid. And we had five alternates attached to this bid also. Um, we have roughly $95,000 in funds for both projects. However, the bid came in well in excess of that. So if we back out the alternates <laughs> that we have here, um, we can do the base bid, which is thermoplastic um, markings throughout the project. On South Street, it would be bike lanes. It would be center line travel lanes. It would be fog lanes. It would also be some rumble strips separating the bike lanes to the travel path of cars. And then there's some paper marking up in the, uh, like I said, the front Leonard Street area. And then for $5,000 extra, we get to experiment with something that we've been trying to do but haven't found the funds to do it, which is inlaid thermoplastic. So basically, it's milled down approximately an eighth of an inch into the ground, and that thermoplastic is then laid, in, laid flush level with the pavement. So it reduces that chopping and chinking from plowing operations and other wear and tear. MassDOT is just starting to play with this in the past year or so, and it's something that we want to see if we want to make it a standard. So this $5,000 alternate will provi provide 1,000 feet of it inside the South Street project, and we can evaluate that over the next course of five to six years to see how it holds up. Is that the kind where they lay it in and then hit it with a, 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 like a blowtorch? It's actually, um, it's milled out, the roadway is milled out, and then the, the, the overlay comes in with a thermoplastic, and it just fills that void that was milled out, the strip of four inch wide by eight inch deep, and just so fills it. So is it a liquid? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, it and is, then it hardens itself. It is hot. Yes, yeah. as it goes in, it's hot. We could have done the entire project uh, on South Street for an additional $20,000, but we don't have the funds to do that. Like I said, we would have preferred to have done that on... Our concern with South Street is that the pavement level on South Street is in an order of probably seven to eight years away from replacement at this point. We've done maintenance on it, we've done crack sealing, but it's starting to take its toll. The lifespan of thermoplastic is typically in the five year, six year range, so we think that this will coincide with the Resident. failure of the pavement of South Street also, rather than painting it every single year. What's the dollar amount? Uh, total dollar is ninety one eight ninety six. That includes alternate one. Is that chapter ninety or is that? It, this is all mitigation funds. Okay, all right, you said that. So, like alternate number five was the use of two solar speed signs, one down by uh, New South Street, the other one out by uh, Grove Street as you come into the city. So. The way we have to take these alternate bids, we have to take them off five, four, three, two, one, as we have our funding. So we had funding for alternate one only. All in favor of approval. Uh, is there any? Uh, do we have any? Uh, experience? I'm concerned about the rumble strips between the traffic lane and the bike lane, and what that's going to be like for bicyclists. These are cut, right? So they're similar to what's further out on Route 10 going to East Hampton? Not as quite a rapid succession as on Route 10, okay. but that's what they are, basically. Basically, it's a delineator for the cars to stay out of the bike lane. No, I know. I, just, I know what happens when you're a biker 
it works both ways, believe me. You don't want to get in there. So those those strips actually stop before intersecting side streets, things of that nature. Okay, so, so where the, you would typically want to turn. In. There's avoidances, yes. Okay. All in favor of approving the contract for payment markings, rumble strips, and signage. Uh, oh, um, we didn't have time to prepare the signature sheets in the full contract, so we're going to ask the board to come in and sign at their leisure over the next week or so. Once we let you know. Sorry about that. If we were to plan our leisure time, <laughs> when would we anticipate <laughs> And and if, if you found it at the back door, the staff is here usually 7 to 7, 7 to 15 in the morning until about 5. No, 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 we're we're, like, we're, we're not going to show up no, tomorrow. No, not tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, we'll, we'll send, send you an email, email when you're ready. ready. Okay, contract for resident services for three city projects. Why is three, Kemp, is this a, for three city projects? Three city. I need to check with my administrative staff. <laughs> staff? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it was just too we're, much we're to type out. Of of this we have our, <laughs> this is a contract with Bob Nelson for assistance with um, resident inspection work on three projects that we have uh, mm -hmm. in the planning stages here. Um, we're finding that we don't have, we don't think we're going to have staff capable this summer and fall to take care of all the projects that are going to be under construction. So. We get asked Bob for a proposal to help us with these projects if, in fact, we're going to need his help, which we think we will. Um, the three projects are um, the North King Street water main replacement, which is um, nearing um, final design, getting ready for bid. Um, the, the estimate for um, inspection services on that project is $16,250. The second project is the Isabella uh, Street sewer replacement project, which the board is familiar with, I think, after all the discussions about that. Um, we have a budget of uh, 80 hours of inspection time on that. Uh, the value is $5,350. The last project is the leachate treatment um, plant decommissioning project. We have some um, Department, of Environment, Department of Environmental Protection permit requirements to have uh, an inspector on site anytime the contractor is doing below grade excavation or removal of um, infrastructure. So we have a, a budget of 120 hours uh, for that project with an estimated value of $8,025, bringing the total contract amount to $29,625. So, any questions? All in favor of approving the contract for resident services? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> okay, change order number one to the contract for the leachate treatment plant decommissioning to Burke Construction in the amount of zero. Move approval. Okay. That's work for that one. This is, uh, this is a no-cost change order to the leachate decommissioning project, and, and what it does is it, um, it makes part of the contract document both the Department of Environmental Protection um, permit for the project and also the Conservation Commission order of conditions for the project. So essentially it, it makes these permits part of the, ob the contractor's obligation to comply. Um, when we didn't have the permits at the time of bidding, when after we got the permits we made them available to the contractor who reviewed contents of the permits and he said I'm going to be doing all this stuff anyway, it's not going to be a any, any additional cost to him to take care of them, but we wanted to, to formalize them and make them part of the contract. Okay. Any questions? All in favor of approving change order number one? Aye. 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 Contract for a premix heater, premix heater step model to J.C. Madigan in the amount of $8,076. Uh, we're going to trade in our Dura patcher and a skid mounted sander and a truck with a hook lift. Skid mounted skid mounted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is a big this is like a big deal. Yeah, yeah. 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 Are these, these come with cards and pictures? Is there bubble gum? So this is they're the, sitting out uh, back, you like the to go visit them. 
This is the hot patch gizmo. That, uh, this is the box that travels around typically during the winter time we do for pothole operations. Uh, what we found out with the Dura Patcher over the time period, it was fairly expensive to run, especially the electrical loads it took to keep that tank hot. We had a 5,000 gallon tank, and it was costing, not 5,000, excuse me, I think it was a 2,000 gallon tank. And it was costing us over $5,000 a year in electrical costs to keep it heated year round. So we decided that we were going to mothball, looking at the cost of buying liquid asphalt and the rock and running the piece of equipment and the age of the equipment, which is over 10 years old at this point. And the new hot boxes are so efficient running that they carry up to four tons of, of uh, asphalt. Uh, the department wants to move forward with two hot boxes for pothole repair. As you probably know, our budget went from $25,000 a year for pothole repair to over $100,000 two years ago due to the lack of the city's ability to keep up with repaving city streets, maintaining them properly. So this is really a late fall to spring use that we use this equipment. Four tons of asphalt in the hot box typically lasts the morning when we're out doing patching. So this way we can go a full day of patching. And what we do in the fall is we, we call them ingots, but we basically they can make bituminous curving, cut into one foot sections, cool it, and we store it. And during the winter time, we fill up these hot boxes and heat it all up, and we have fresh asphalt to work with. Recycled. Well, kind of, but it's new. New recycle it hasn't been in, hasn't been put, put put down on the roadway yet. It's uh, free from free from yes, recycle. yeah. Right. New to us. Free to have. <laughs> all right. So we we buy it. I mean, there's a market for unused curving. No, no, no. We, we make it ourselves. We have a burn machine. That okay, we so we just curving. extrude it and chop it up. Exactly. This is a way to store it. Um, okay, all in favor of approving well, this gun? Another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go well, ahead. Can you speak to the equipment we're trading in? Sure. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the Durapatcher machine, like I said, is at least 10 or 12 years old. Yeah. And uh, the cost of running it, and uh, it's, it's actually cheaper to use the asphalt. The other two vehicles that are being traded in are what we call our old Captain Hook snow fighting truck. They're actually uh, old military trucks that were retrofitted, trying to make a snow fighting fleet back um, in the early 2000 era, 1999-2000 era. And they're basically rotted and laying out in the backyard doing not much of anything anymore. I need to get the brush on this. Okay. Any further questions? All in favor of approving the contract for the pre next heater? Aye. 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 <coughs> All right. Next is private ways. Um, so you're all familiar with the issue. Uh, we've been informed that it's um, against the state standard. There's a state statute um, from advising from 43 or 40, 43, I guess. advising municipalities that they may not file private ways and we have a number of them in the city um, I think you Chris I, I don't know how familiar you are with this I'm learning about it quick for <laughs> I, I, all right so here, here's the deal we have about 40 private ways more or less these are roads that have not been formally accepted by the city council as official city streets. Uh, some of them, as you might imagine, are a little dirt, you know, more, a little more than a driveway. But some of them look just like a street, like any other street. Right? Um, so we've been working somewhat behind the scenes trying to think of a way to accept these streets. And it's, just, it's been a slog. Um, and the winter is coming in the no another snow plowing season, is upon us almost. Ned was thinking maybe the simplest thing to do, oh, let me give you some perspective on this. <clears throat> we have about three miles of private ways out of over 150 miles of streets in the city. Uh, if you do the math, it turns out that plowing these private ways accounts for only fifteen, seventeen thousand $17,000 a year. Everything we've looked at in terms of accepting private ways as official city streets looks like it'd be really expensive. Our attorney is advising us that we need a survey and we need a, a stack of legal documents so that the homeowners on a given private way 
grant the city the easement over their, the edge of their property up by the street. A, a single street could cost five to $10,000 of surveying legal fees. And this no. is to save the fact that we're spending perhaps fifteen or 17000 to just simply plow those roads. Right. <clears throat> so Ned has suggested maybe the simplest thing to do, at least for the moment, is to... Uh, let me give you one more piece of information. The, the statute regarding this is very brief and very precise. Uh, it says that if a city would like to plow private ways, the method by which you could do this involves a ballot question, getting the approval of the voters to, to spend public money essentially maintaining property rights. And they even tell you exactly what the language of the ballot question must be. So if we have any hope of putting a ballot question on this upcoming election's ballots, we have to move right along with this. Um, so what we're suggesting this evening, or what we're, what we're bringing to the board, is the idea that we recommend to the city council that they put such a question on the ballot. The question is, if not everyone has a copy of this, Peter? No. <coughs> Just you. Okay, so the motion is this. The Board of Public Works recommends to the Northampton City Council to place the following question on the upcoming city ballot. The question is this. Shall the city vote to accept provisions of Section 6C of Chapter 40 of the General Laws, which authorize cities and towns to appropriate money for the removal of snow and ice from private ways therein open? For the removal of snow and ice from private ways therein open to public use. We'll have to have some explanation. I think so. Well, that means it's open to the public. <coughs> I, I just, just, just literally, uh, yeah. by, by virtue of plowing therein, there. it is open to public use. Right. Well, it's unrestricted by a gate or right. any other. So this, this is this is the, uh, the wording of the, um, the statute. <laughs> But how many citizens do you think would uh, all can just vote yes or no? Oh, man. Well, there are five of us here. <laughs> well, we uh, the again, here's the, here's, the, here's the balance. Here's the, uh, the equation. Five, Fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars a year to just simply plow them. Versus five or ten thousand per street, perhaps. To right. move them through the process to become accepted. Um, the city attorney is, it just kind of makes us hate the air, it's catch on fire thinking about it. Um, it's, it's hard to say precisely what the process is. There is no exact process for accepting a street. In the past, we've done it fairly casually. We, we accepted a bunch of streets back in the, uh, about 10 years ago. Maybe not even that long ago. Ned? I'm sorry. When did we, uh, the last batch of streets we accepted? Um, we accepted a huge batch in 1997. <coughs> and last year we did some. Well, we've done a couple of streets, but okay. last year, there, in 1997, I think there was 31 streets <coughs> in the city council. It was almost by people. acclamation. There, there was none of the, the <coughs> rigmarole associated at that time. And as, we, and as we come across more of these streets that were done according to subdivision standards in the 60s and 70s, we brought those forward over time. And more recently, there are streets associated with the State Hospital Redevelopment and Cardinal Way, some of the newer subdivisions that have happened. Some of the newer subdivision streets have all of the documents in place. The, uh, they just neglected that final step of taking the package to the City Council for approval. Uh, the, some of these streets meet every single requirement you could possibly ask for. Right. They just never did that last step. Are we plowing them already? Yeah. So it's not going to cost us any more. No. The only, the, only, the only downside to the Northampton taxpayer was if we didn't do this, in theory, if we stopped plowing them, we would save some money. We'd save a little bit of money at enormous inconvenience. Yeah, no, so no, I'm not arguing that. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. trying to make the taxpayer's argument. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do with this is actually bring us into compliance with state law, too. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. Yeah. 
Uh, the other point is that this has been reviewed several meetings with the our joint committee with the city council. Yeah. And they, they're endorsing this approach. Yeah. So, do we so need to make that motion? Yes. So move. We have a second. Second. All right, so again, we're asking the city council to uh, place this question on the ballot. Right. Me? I do have just one quick question. This is only, uh, look, does the question specify that it's only for existing ones that we plow? Or, because I mean, there are other people who have private ways, and will that then open the I floodgates know, to people? Because I know there's that woman that's downtown who's been trying to get people to plow her street for some time. So I'm just curious what is the outcome of that. Well, that that's what we are plowing that's that street. the word, wording that you were mm -hmm. talking about. Are we plowing that street? Uh, next private, to uh, private ways with public access. The old oak slash. Center court. Center court. Yeah. We are plowing that street. We do? So if somebody oh. has a private way, you know, know their that. driveway, that's, that's oh, that the public access. So I would want her to come to city council as I told you and explain it to the public because they really need to be educated about that wording. Right. And the other point is we have no flexibility on the wording. No. It's, it's, it's stipulated in the yeah. uh, ordinance. Mm -hmm. But there isn't really a lot of flexibility on the issue either. No. Well, the mayor has told me that um, he, he, he doesn't think it's appropriate to simply brush it on the carpet and ignore it. Um, so we have to make some attempt to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Other than, you know, the sort of the back of the envelope estimations of what it would, might cost per street, have we actually attempted to do a, even one cost analysis of what it would cost the city to incorporate one of these streets? Legal fees, etc.? See where I'm going? They're all different lengths, lists, number of property owners, so there's, there's going to be a large variable cost. Uh, I understand that. But and, and, I, and I had asked the mayor, I said, look, how about we, we squeeze a couple of these streets through the process just so we can find out what's involved, how, you know, yeah. where are the pitfalls, how does it go? And uh, his feeling was, and uh, Bill Dwight's feeling was, that it wasn't fair to not just, I mean, they felt it was all or nothing. Yeah, no, I, 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 I understood, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think we had, we had said it would be like five to $10,000 or possibly more per street in order to do the paperwork. So that would be for every street, and there's what, 30, how many streets we have? There's private 40 ways. plus. 40 plus private yeah. ways. No, I, 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 got, I got you. I, I believe it. I just, I'm going to say, all I'm saying is that if we're going to make an argument to the taxpayer that we're saving them money, we know what the cost of plow is. It'd be nice to have a, a good, solid number to which we could compare it. Even if we just say, and even if we only look at these three streets, it's already twenty thousand dollars, kind of thing. And we've got twenty-eight other ones we've got to cover. I think it puts us in a better position. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the goal is there's a number of private ways that we probably have no business being on, yet we have historically done. Right. So there's some of these private ways I think that will just fall off the map that we're going to maintain or even look at maintaining. And there's some other ones, as Terry said, they look, they feel, they look, and they're they're a city way. Yeah. I mean, Hillcrest and Florence is a perfect example. It was built in the 60s, the subdivision standards, it's pinned, it's laid Some out. Some of the nicest houses in Florence are on that street. And it's never been accepted by the city. Yeah. Who maintains the substandard streets? I mean, the really substandard private ways. A lot of the substandard private ways have already fallen off that we don't do anything with, like Short Street, Railroad Street, some of these little it ends to one small building off of Pleasant Street. They, they've already fallen off the list that we don't do anything with and haven't done. And Terry and Gary, when they're visiting these places, the people are coming out saying, what are you doing in my driveway? Yeah. yeah. A couple of people accosted us. But if, if we did approve these entries, then we take responsibility for maintenance. Well, yes. Oh, oh it's with perhaps no, in many cases. It's, it's a mixed bag. This this actually all originated out of the town of Wellfleet Mass. 
uh, back a few years ago. And I spoke with the DPW director in Wellfleet about it. And what they did was they put it to a town vote. And basically any private way that they're existing, that was existing that we were doing plowing and snow removal operations on, that's what the vote was for. So any new streets weren't included, and the town does not maintain these during the spring, summer, fall also. And in fact, they're in the process of putting out policies for these private ways that they do snow and ice operations on, that they need to make sure that the brush is clear from the sides of the roads on a yearly basis, tree trimming, so on, so they don't tear the top racks of the trucks off, things like that. But this is after the election. After the after it was submitted to a vote. The and policy and, for maintaining and, and the vote was to pay for snow plow, but nothing else. That's correct. Well, who's in your office? But what was happening with Town of Wellfleet is that residents of the private ways weren't maintaining them, and the plow trucks were going down there and getting scraped and banged up and broken windows from branches and, and this is how they're dealing with it going forward saying we're not going to go in there unless you <coughs> maintain this so that we can get in there and buy. Right. Marianne? When are you planning on moving this to city council? At the, your next meeting? That's the, remember we're not having one the first of September that week because of it being a municipal election. So our meeting's being canceled. So we're having our next meeting September 20th. And if you want to put it on the ballot, you have so no, many days, you better talk Sorry. to Wendy. Sorry. I think Paul Specker said in the joint committee meeting that a special council meeting would be necessary when I get the ballot yeah. question. Yeah. It's, it's, All right, so anyway, that's that's the gist of it. Um, so, as I say, Ned uh, has recommended, and I, I think I agree, that I, there's clearly no no way we're going to move these streets through any kind of an acceptance process between now and snow season. Um, it's really our only alternative to see if we could at least attempt. It's just... This, this is such a mess. Well, but it, so it has to go to the ballot. Yeah. I mean, we're not really capable of doing otherwise. And, and if it doesn't pass? I know. It, oh, it's, just, it's, it's got awful all over it. So um, it's okay. on the agenda for nine years. I guess we stopped <laughs> on in private ways. Maybe we could enlist some private way residents to um, help spread the vote. All in favor of um, asking the city council to consider putting us on the ballot. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, solid waste planning update. I put in your package a letter from August 6, 2012 from American Tower Corporation. Yeah. Kind of a fake check, but $926,000 for the perpetual easement. How much are you now receiving? About $65,000 a year. We have eight years left in the contract. It's going to escalate. The base fee escalates at 4%, and we get 20% of the carrier fees, which fluctuate a little bit. But right now, it's about $65,000 a year that we collect. The, the uh, letter didn't speak about a term, did it? There is no term. We would grant them a perpetual easement. They would own it forever. Well, okay. yeah. They didn't use the word perpetual either. Uh, they did, actually. Did they? Yeah. So the last time we did this in 2010, they offered about $625,000 was their offer. And we came very stalled down with the legal teams on both sides, and city finally just walked away from it. Here, we'll just let the, the thing move its course. But I did want to bring to the board. I mean, I saw 920, so that's a good chunk of change. Whether or not the city wants to look at going down that path again, I'm unsure. So Ned and I talked about it. The um, the enter the solid waste enterprise fund is in reasonably good shape. It looks like by the time the landfill closes, we will be able to meet our obligations. Uh, we believe that the long-term closure fund is adequately 
funded. Um, so in a sense, we don't need the million dollars for the nine hundred thousand um, dollars for any immediate project. The, what we stumbled over last time is that uh, there was quite a bit of back and forth about issues of liability. Uh, they wanted the city to assume all liability for the, um, the tower and whatever might happen, uh, which didn't seem to make sense to us. I think there's some other issues, too. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting, I think, well, I think it's interesting that in the two-year period, they upped the ante by $300,000. We lost two years of the contract time, so obviously they know something more than I do about the future right. of what this site could bring. Right. The future is cell phones, and, and it's obviously appreciating at this time what it what it might be worth five years from now. That's an interesting question. I think the future is beyond, way beyond cell phones. It's um, wireless networks that. So whatever you can get in your cell phone, and whatever you can get in your desktop, that's what you can get in your cell phone. You already, you already right. get it, basically, so it's, yeah. It's opening up the, you know, uh, airwaves is probably not the right term, but the bandwidth or whatever. So, yeah, there the just could be a lot more revenue for somebody owning a tower to send out that information. Right. Well, it seems as though they've reached that conclusion. Yeah, obviously. So no action is required unless, I guess... Yeah. What about number two? Number uh, three. three. Your three. Check? Yeah. Oh, Claims oh, committee. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, Rose not here, but probably we could. Just next meeting. Yeah. Five and five fifteen. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We oh. have more in the room. I can't read that small print in September. It's second Wednesday of the month? Yes. Is the 8th. Oh, no, that's August. 12th. Pardon me. 12th. It yeah. is the 12th. Okay. Yeah. And September 12th, 5 and 5.15. Is that enough time for this? Yeah. I believe so. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next order of business is an executive session, and it's our last order of business. I'm not going to go around the table and ask everybody if they have something oh, to say. Oh, I will. I'll just let you know. <laughs>